Uh, we will still welcome you. Glad you are here. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. It is right at 7 p.m. on September 18th, 2024. This is the second regular city commission meeting uh, in commission chambers for the city of Ormond Beach for the month of September. And curiously enough, because of the law, we normally meet the first and third Tuesdays, but because Volusia County does their budget hearings on the first and third Tuesday this month, we're required to have our meeting on a different day. So Wednesday, Wednesday it is, but uh, you all found out about it and we're able to be here. So thank you and uh, we'll, get, we'll get to it. I wanna introduce the folks who are sitting up in front of you this evening. Uh, but first, I hope you felt welcomed when you came in. Our finance director, Kelly McGuire, and our assistant finance director, Chris Bile, served as the greeters this evening. They are our multi-year award-winning finance and budget team, and we're proud to have them under Joyce's uh, direction and leadership. If you need a card to speak on any item, uh, see Kelly. She'll get you uh, filled out, or Chris, and get you in the queue to speak. And uh, we'll do the introductions now. To my right, your left, our recording secretary, Taylor Lockhart. City Clerk, Susan Dodderus. Our Commissioner from Zone 1, Lori Tolland. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Commissioner from Zone 2, Travis Sargent. Good evening and welcome. To my left and your right, Commissioner from Zone 3, Susan Persis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Then we have our Deputy Mayor and Zone 4, Commissioner Harold Briley. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. City Manager, Joyce Shanahan. Assistant City Managers, uh, Sean Finley and Claire Whitley. Somewhere I saw her. Um, she's running an errand, okay. And then City Attorney, Randy Hayes. And then way to my left and way to your right, we have the Chiefs with us again tonight. Police Chief, Jesse Godfrey, and Fire Chief, Howard Bailey. For those of you listening online, I'm Mayor Bill Partington. At this time, if you would please silence your cell phones rise for the invocation given tonight by Father Roy Allison from St. James Episcopal Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful city of Ormond Beach. We pray for our Mayor Bill, for our City Commissioners, for Lori, Travis, Susan, and Harold. We pray for our city commissioner, our deputy mayor. We pray for Joyce, our city manager, and for Randy, our city attorney. We pray for their commitment to serve the people and businesses of this great community. May the discussions and decisions made here tonight provide for the needs of our community, and may they bring you honor and glory. Pour out your blessings of peace, protection, and provision for our first responders, our city employees, our civic leaders, and for all who live and work in this great city. Help us to break down the walls of violence, hatred, and racism, and fill our hearts with care, compassion, and love for all people. We thank you, Lord God, for our many blessings that you provide us, and we ask that you would guide us this night and always to direct us to use those blessings and to be a blessing to others. And we pray this, and I pray this, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is presentations and proclamations. It really is the best part of the meeting. In a community like Ormond Beach, an incredible city uh, with tremendous leadership, 
from our staff and uh, policy direction from the city commission. We wouldn't be so wonderful if we didn't have wonderful residents and then wonderful elected officials above us that helped us accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish. So tonight I get the opportunity to recognize uh, our Florida legislators. These are individuals who do incredible work. Uh, it's extremely difficult. Uh, they're not paid very much, honestly. I think it's $29,000 a year. Uh, it upends their lives and the fact that they're back and forth from Tallahassee multiple times uh, in a month. And then uh, even though they're up there for two months out of the year, they come home to the district on weekends. And so they're dealing, you know, we think we deal with a lot of issues, commission, and we do. Uh, but go to a legislative uh, delegation meeting someday. They're usually uh, held anywhere from November to February. Sit there from 8 in the morning till 6 in the evening and listen to the hundreds of people who come and present different issue after different issue. And they're not easy issues, they're complex issues. Uh, these folks deal with that on all of our behalfs. And so we're grateful for that. And we're gonna, government uh, doesn't always do the best job of, of stopping to thank and recognize the people who are involved. We're gonna do that tonight. We're gonna stop and recognize uh, some folks. I'm gonna call them up and present them with a plaque. First, uh, I think it's safe to uh, identify our representative leak as the dean at this point of the Volusia County Legislative Delegation. He's been here for eight years. He made that commitment nine and a half years ago and he kept it. He's been here for the full eight years and we're hoping uh, he's gonna be continuing to serve us. Representative Leak, come on up. He's also our hometown Hero, and it's an honor to present you uh, on behalf of the city of Ormond Beach, its residents and visitor, visitors. Uh, it's with great honor and appreciation that we recognize you for your steadfast advocacy and support for our beautiful city and community. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, uh, on behalf of Representative Chase Tremont, who is in the district just to the south of us, but is part of our Volusia County legislative delegation. Chase, my understanding is in Tallahassee. He got called, had to go uh, last night. But on his behalf is his legislative aide, Duncan DeMarsh, on behalf of Representative Chase Tremont. And then, uh, a little bit to the west of us, maybe southwest, is Representative Webster Barnaby. And on his behalf this evening, we have Drake Wyman. Drake. <laughs> and then uh, Senator Wright, who is uh, actually our senator as well here in Ormond Beach. He covers part of Ormond Beach. Uh, and then primarily is to the south of us. We have Ms. Charlene Gagner on his behalf, Senior Legislative Aide. Next uh, is also a very special presentation. Is Evelyn Rabastini in the house? There she is. Evelyn is our victim advocate, yes. Evelyn is retiring. 
And nobody, uh, nobody asked my permission, I'll tell you that, right? <laughs> not that you have to, not that you have to. Uh, she has been an amazing advocate uh, and such a hard worker in our police department. You see some of the folks who are here lined up in the back of the room tonight to honor her and recognize her. Um, Evelyn, you know, some people retire and they wonder, did I do enough? Was I, was I there enough? Did I make an impact? You never have to wonder that. And I think that's fantastic. You uh, can enjoy your retirement. You can do whatever you want to do. You can still come back and volunteer with us if you want. <laughs> Just a suggestion. But you don't have to. I mean, you sleep well at night knowing that you've given it your all and you've helped hundreds which is, which is just incredible. So I'm honored to present you with a proclamation, and I'm going to read it. I'll have you hold it, and then we're going to get you and your family up for a picture with everybody. Whereas Evelyn Robustini's journey began in Miami Beach, Florida, before she made Flagler County her home in 1991. She pursued her studies at Daytona State College, earning an Associate of Science degree in Paralegal Studies since 2004, Evelyn has dedicated herself to advocating for victims. And whereas Evelyn's distinguished career as a victim advocate began with the state attorney's office where she served for 12 years prior to joining the city of Ormond Beach in 2016, her exceptional work has been recognized with multiple accolades, including Victim Advocate of the Year and Volunteer of the Year. Her unwavering commitment to ensuring victims' rights are upheld, heard, and treated with respect has been significant in rebuilding trust in the criminal justice and social service systems. And whereas Evelyn has actively contributed to a variety of organizations, including serving as Vice President of the Victim Services Coalition of the Seventh Judicial Circuit and participating on the Board of Crime Stoppers, the Domestic Violence Advisory Committee, the Human Trafficking Assault Response Team, the Community Christmas Club, and Bikers Against Child Abuse. Through these roles, she has demonstrated a dedication to justice and positively impacted our community. And where we celebrate Evelyn Rebastini's retirement and express our deepest gratitude for her tireless service to the Ormond Beach community. We extend our heartfelt congratulations and best wishes as she embarks on this new chapter which promises more cherished moments with her husband, three children, eight grandchildren, and three great grandchildren. So Evelyn will also enjoy her passions for gardening and crafting, including creating beautiful for special occasions. Now, therefore, based on all of that, I, Bill Partington, along with the entire Ormond Beach City Commission, do hereby proclaim today, September 18th, 2024, as a day to honor and recognize Evelyn in the city of Ormond Beach and encourage all city staff and residents to join me in wishing Evelyn the very best in her well-deserved retirement. Congratulations. Evelyn, there's a little bit more. We always say, but wait, there's more. Uh, because of your absolute kindness, your compassion to others, uh, the way that you care, your caring shows, it's my honor to you with a key to the city of Ormond Beach. I'll let you hold that. She's running out of hands. And we're going to get a picture.
emotional. <laughs> First, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Mayor Partington and the city of Ormond Beach, all the commissioners, my chief, for the wonderful proclamation. It truly means a lot to me. As I stand here tonight, I reflect on nearly nine incredible years as a victim advocate with Ormond Beach Police Department. It's been a journey filled with challenges, growth, and unforgettable moments. I had the privilege of working alongside some of the most dedicated individuals who share a commitment to making our community a safer place, and they're all here tonight. I want to extend a special thank you to my colleagues. Your support has made my work not only meaningful, but also a joy every day. Together, we've made a difference in countless lives. I hope the impact of our efforts continues to resonate in the city of Ormond Beach. This role has taught me invaluable lessons about compassion, resiliency, and importance of advocacy. I've grown both personally and professionally, and I will carry these lessons with me into this new chapter of my life. Looking ahead, I'm excited about retirement, what retirement holds, whether it's spending more time with family, pursuing new hobbies, or simply enjoying life at a slower pace. I will always cherish the memories and friendships I have made with all of you. Thank you once again for your support and encouragement. I wish the department and this wonderful community all the best in the future. remiss if I didn't call Representative Lee back up. Uh, we have a key to the city for you, Representative. Uh, like I said, Tom is ours. We consider him ours. He's Ormond Beach, born and bred, and he did, has done so much for us in the last eight years. I can't begin to uh, <clears throat> start rattling rattling things off, whether it was the US-1 and 95 interchange, uh, things that make a direct impact and will make a direct impact on our daily lives, whether it was the special events zones during uh, special events on the beach side, keep us all safer and help our officers with enforcement. Um, I could go on and on. We could be here all night. But I wanted to specifically present that to you. Thank you, and uh, we look forward to continued success for you. Item five, the adoption of the fiscal year 24-25 millage rates and budget. Uh, I'll ask for your forgiveness in advance. I have a lot of stuff that I need to, need to read here. But uh, first, I'm going to open the public hearings and ask the clerk to read 5A by title only. Resolution number 2024-146, a resolution adopting final millage rates to be levied for fiscal year 2024-2025. 
directing certification, expressing legislative intent, and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2024-146, read by title only. Thank you, Susan. Per Florida statute, I'm required to state that the final millage rate for the city of Ormond Beach necessary to fund the fiscal year 2024-2025 budget is 4.0960 mills. This rate is 12.82% above the rollback rate of 3.6305 mills. The final debt service millage is 0 0.065 for the 2010 General Obligation Bond Sinking Fund. This is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak or ask questions prior to adoption of the final millage rate? And Madam Clerk, I do have one card, I believe. Yes. It's Sean Daly. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Sean Daly. I live in the Northbrook subdivision. Uh, I, too, am Armin born and bred, have been here my entire life. Um, served a number of years with Mr. Briley on various boards in the city, development review, uh, environmental board, planning board. Um, I'm here tonight, and I haven't been here in years. And I can't say I've missed it, but... Uh, um, and I can't say most of you miss me either. So, but the bottom line is, I'm here because for the second year in a row, there's been a tax increase. And, you know, in Ormond, we're not used to that. Um, especially if you remember Nick Fortunato, we were never used to that. We never went above rollback with Nick Fortunato. Now, I'm sure what you all are doing is because there's a lot of things that need to be paid for. And that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is the fact that, that I'm, you'll also note 10A I'm here to talk on, which is the airport fund. Years ago, there was a big brouhaha in this city about noise abatement and the airport. And one of the things that came up then was the fact that even then, that's more than 10 years ago, there was a huge amount owed by the airport to the general fund huge amount. It was like a half million dollars then. I don't know what it is now. For which the city has not received a penny in interest, has never been paid back. Now I'm finally, at, at that point in time at one of the various meetings that we went to, my suggestion was that we have landing fees for people who utilize the airport so that we could pay back that money to the general fund. And if we had done that, maybe at least one of these tax increases could have been avoided. I'm certain if we had just charged a few percent interest, a lot of money could be generated. Now I know that it's coming up again on 10A and I'm gonna be up again to talk about it then, but I'm very verbose and we only get three minutes, so I thought I'd, since it come up, I'd, it's gonna come up twice. Um, but recognize I have nothing against the airport. I will point out, I've been here long enough to remember when there was a survey done by the city of Ormond Beach about the various services that the city provided and having the citizens rank those services. The airport came in dead last, and there's a reason. It doesn't serve a great percentage of citizens here. Does it provide a valid function? Yes. Do I have a problem with the airport itself? No. But I have a problem with the way the airport has become. And I certainly have a problem with general revenue funds subsidizing it when there is a perfectly va viable revenue source. And see, I told you I'd use it by three minutes. All right, we'll Thank see you in a little bit. Thank you, Sean. Um, any other cards, Susan? No. Thank you. I just need a motion so and a second to adopt second. the final millage rates. Thank you. Uh, I heard the motion from Deputy Mayor Briley, second from Commissioner Tolland. The final operating millage of 4.0960 mills is 12.82% above the rolled back millage rate of 3.6305 mills. The resolution also includes adoption of the final debt service millage rate of 0 0.065 for the 2010 General Obligation Bond Sinking Fund. Please call the vote. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. The final operating millage rate is set at 4.0960 mills, which is 
above the rolled back millage rate of 3.6305 mills. 5B. Ordinance number 2024-25, an ordinance adopting the annual budget for the 2024-2025 fiscal year beginning October 1, 2024 and ending September 30, 2025, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof and setting forth an effective date. This is the second reading of ordinance number 2024-25, read by title only. Thank you. I just need a motion and a second. I for move approval. approval of ordinance number 2024-25. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion, Commission? Please call the vote to adopt the budget of $131,976,868. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And uh, do I hear any objection to closing the public hearing? Hearing none, the public hearing is closed, and we will go to audience remarks. And tonight, we start with Cindy Costa. When you make your audience remarks, if you'll direct your comments to me, come on up, and uh, you'll have three minutes. And if you would, please speak uh, directly into the microphone. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm concerned about North Beach Street between Overbrook and Heather. We have a very large tree growing close to the road and the roots have lifted the road so when you're driving and you go over it, it kind of it tilts you into the oncoming traffic and this is going north if that doesn't get resolved there's no markings to even warn anybody that there's that's coming up so i would like to have somebody look into it thank you yep we'll make sure and i'll have uh, one of our staff give you a card just so you can follow up. Okay. As well. yep. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia Simmons. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you tonight. My name's Alicia Simmons and I'm wearing three hats. I'm a long timer commercial real estate broker for over 35 years here in the state of Florida. And I'm a business and management consultant and I'm a tennis player. And I'm here to request a $300,000 grant from your Daytona Beach Racing and Rec Center um, a fund for the um, OBTC Ormond Beach Tennis Center, which is one of the gems in your community. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of Trisna She's your um, tennis director and uh, also inducted into the Hall of Fame of Tennis at Brown University. The reason this is so important is this location is such a historic hall landmark for y'all. It's part of the casements and half a mile and a half to the beach. And what we're wanting to do with the funds is to upgrade the tennis courts, the clay. It, it's requiring 40 tons of clay, um, laser resurfacing, to make it really state of the art and lights, transitioning the lights to LED and desperately needed showers. And so after matches, the players can refresh themselves and then go out to the area which is full of um, restaurants, shops, and really boosting your economy. And so I'm here again um, to ask all of you to just look at this as not as investment to the facility, but as an investment to your community because it'll attract more tourism and visitors who can explore on foot the surrounding area. And so thank you again, and I hope you take this request um, favorably, and I urge all of you to come out to see what Trisna's done, because in just six months since she's been awarded the contract, she has spent $37,000 of her own money, attracted and served 5,100 tennis players and has two teams in GVTL, and we're going to start another team for the USTA in January. And so she has done a dynamic job with the Junior Academy, and she's got, she's re recreated the uh, pro shop into a learning facility to teach strategy and, and tennis tactics to the kids. And so it's just a great vibe, so I urge all of you to come out and continue to build on what she's already done with this grant. 
Thank you. Thank you. And last uh, for audience comments, but not least, is Connie Colby. Good evening, Connie Colby, 108 Robel Lane, Ormond Beach. Um, tonight, I'd like to um, talk about Central Park, especially in um, Hammock Lane area. Um, while the parks were developed a while ago, there were different expectations as to how they were going to be used. Mostly it's like walking, tennis, um, picnicking, fishing, those kind of activities. Since then, kids have learned to use different kind of things like motorized vehicles. Um, some of them are like motor bicycles, more bigger than bicycles, smaller than a real motorcycle. And um, in our area especially, we have a couple of big fields. One of the fields is currently being used as a motocross facility where, especially one kid, he rides around every, every evening about 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And that property's gotten pretty wet. Last time, I think we just approved some money for the park um, service for keeping the property looking nice, too. Um, I don't think that's one of the reasons that the park is supposed to be used for. Um, but I couldn't find anything online as to exactly what it's supposed to be used for. Um, so I would like to think that something like that might be looked at also, especially around holiday times. A lot of the kids get drone airplanes or whatever those things are flying all around and there's little kids around that they don't really know how to use them properly. So people can get hurt with those as well. Um, as far as the um, motorcycle things, maybe they could do something like that up by the airport. There's more land up there. It wouldn't bother probably as many people. Not that it's, it's not really noise-wise bothering anybody, but it's still destroying the property. The other thing is the code violations um, where you can't report anything anonymously anymore. It's deteriorating our neighborhoods, and I don't know what the answer is to that, but we have things going on now like people parking their campers in their yards, boats. Um, one neighbor has five, three adult children living home. They have five vehicles and they've got, they're parking all over their yards. And I'm thinking of the new places that want to put little stub driveways in there that are going to have three, three bedrooms and grown kids. They're going to have not enough driveways to put their cars in to start with. So they'll be all over the streets. Um, That, prob that problem is a state problem. I don't know how they're going to resolve that. <laughs> Maybe he can do something about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Connie. <coughs> All right. We, uh, commission will now go to approval of the minutes. These are from September 4th, 2024. They've been sent to the commission for review, also posted to the city's website. Any additions, deletions, or corrections? Move approval. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign, and we'll show that passing unanimously. We're now on the consent agenda. The action proposed is stated for each item on the consent agenda, and unless a commissioner removes an item, no discussion on individual items will occur, and a single motion will approve all items. Does any member of the commission wish to pull any agenda items? Deputy Mayor Briley. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull item 8H, please. H. Anyone else? I move approval of the consent agenda minus 8H. Second. Please call the vote. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 8H. Resolution number 2024-157, a resolution authorizing the execution of an agreement for services between the city and Halifax Humane Society, Inc., and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2024-157, read by title only. Thank you. I have one card for 8H, um, and that's Connie Colby. Sorry. Nope. Um, Connie Colby, 108 
Robel Lane. Um, in our neighborhood, we have been overrun with feral cats. They are all over. Um, when I'm reading the contract that you have, it does not provide for anything other than um, returning the cat, picking the cats up, having them neutered, and returning them to the place where they were brought back. So these cats are being brought back to our neighborhood. Um, they're cute little kittens, but they grow up to be cats. And we have a lot of problem with oh, the cat urine. Um, these cats are going to live probably for 18 years. And when they're brought back, we're going to have all of these cats all over our neighborhood for 18 years doing what they do. Um, I am, don't know if there's any other way you can handle that particular part of your contract as far as returning them to the neighborhood. They're, they're not pets to anybody. Some of them are sitting on people's car tops. Some of them are under sheds and they're just roaming all over the place um, and they just keep being more prolific. So if you can think of anything else, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And Mr. Mayor, that's why I pulled that. Uh, Ms. Colby had asked if we could uh, have that pulled and I guess, uh, I guess I would defer to our city manager. I don't know if there's anything we can do. I mean, I know the Humane Society has a, a TNL or trap and release. TNR. They uh, trap and release, and generally they are released back to the neighborhood that they came from. Um, I can ask Captain Roos to come forward and, and speak about that, but um, they are neutered when they uh, are trapped, so they won't be procreating in that instance. So, fortunately or unfortunately, the Humane Society does not like to just euthanize animals. So they came up with the trap, neuter, release, or the TNR program probably about a decade ago. Um, a domestic cat will live to be 18 or 20 years old. Wild cats don't live nearly that long. Uh, their lifespan's way less than that. Uh, and they decided that at some point in time, the best thing was to bring the cats back to where they came from, it, something that's reasonably for them, you know, to, to live out their life. But um, this is what we've been doing for about a decade, at least. And uh, if there's a better plan, we'd be more happy to look at it. Do you think, I know Ms. Colby's relation to, to uh, her geographic location in Central Park, and I'm thinking this may be where a lot of those cats are coming from? We don't perhaps. actually have a cat colony in that area, so okay. I don't know that. Um, you know, there could be you know, stray cats in that area, but as far as a cat colony, there's not one there. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. See, I think it makes sense that we take a look at the contract and see if there's something else we can do. I'd be willing to do that. I think going forward, there's nothing wrong with that. Joyce, staff can do that at any time, right? Renegotiate next year. It was just, you know, this is just the beginning of the contract, but we can start discussions with them to look at that issue. I don't know. I don't know that we have to wait a whole year. I mean, if they, uh, you know, if you work something out in three months and you want to bring yeah. it back to the commission, you can certainly do that. Yeah, I have do. no idea what the answer would be right off the bat, but um, certainly verifying what the situation is, I think, would yeah. be critical to start and uh, going going from there. Yes, ma'am. No, I just wanted to say I know the Humane Society is you know willing to come take a look and check it out. They um, are you know they want to take care of animals as much as possible, so I think that might be one of the first things is have them go take a look. Some information for you. Thank you. And one more, one more comment. Yes, ma'am. You know, maybe it can be data-driven as well. We can find out how many actual cats we are talking about. You know, if in that may merit whether we need to make any changes or not. That sounds good. All right, Commission. That is the consent agenda. We're going to move to public hearings, but before I do, do any commissioners wish to comment I, on any of the consent? Mr. Mayor, we didn't vote on eight vote. H. Oh, did we not yeah. vote? I'm I'll, sorry. I'll move approval of eight H. Thank you. Second. Moved and seconded. Please call the vote on eight H. Commissioner Briley. Yes. Commissioner Tolland. Yes. Commissioner Sargent. Yes. Commissioner Persis. Yes. Mayor Partington. Yes. And Commissioner Sargent for comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to just comment on um, I consent item I. Um, officer Bacaza, who's one of our officers who passed away in the line of duty, um, this is the final um, step in that to provide his family relief. 
with the uh, closing of the workers' comp uh, claim. So I'd just like to thank staff and everyone for everything that uh, we've been able to get done through the pension and through closing out this claim. So, and thank you to his family. Great. Anyone else? Commission, I just wanted to talk about 8C for a second, which, uh, you know, Representative Lee was here earlier. Um, it's the water reclamation facility, ultraviolet disinfection conversion project. Uh, and that was a few million dollars, which we participate in, but we didn't have to carry the full weight of that uh, bill because of the fact that we had representatives who are willing to work with us and that's good for our residents it's good for the environment and uh, kind of puts us at the forefront using technology that really is uh, cutting edge and so I'm excited about that and that's just that's just one example also on 8d uh, multi-million dollar drainage improvements coming for Fleming Avenue mm -hmm. our residents uh, have had concerns deputy mayor Briley you know that's your zone um, and this is just you know, after the downpour that we had this evening, getting here, it seems like we're having these downpours more frequently and uh, being able to handle those better. Uh, it's a few million dollars, but uh, when this is all put together with the final drainage project that's gonna run a line underground from Central Park all the way to the Halifax River, and allow us to pump down both sides of Central Park much quicker than we have the capability to now. The goal is to prevent uh, flooding in the future, and so this goes a long way towards towards making sure that happens. All right, uh, public hearings, agenda item nine. We are now going to open the public hearings, and I'd ask the clerk to read 9A. Ordinance number 2024-26, an ordinance amending chapter two, district and general regulations, article four, conditional and special exception regulations, section 2-57 criteria for review of specific conditional and special exception, subsection 37 houses of worship of the city of Ormond Beach land development code by amending the conditions for houses of worship, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof, providing for severability and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2024-26, read by title only. Thank you. Uh, I have a note to ask the planning director to speak on the item, but it is fairly straightforward, Stephen, unless there's something that you have to put on the record. Stephen Spraker, planning director. I don't really have anything additional. Uh, it is a request to allow through a special exception process, the ability to reduce the setbacks. Planning board did recommend approval. Uh, the applicant is here to address the commission if there are any questions. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I note it was a unanimous uh, recommendation. We're not really voting on anything in particular tonight as far as a project goes. Right. It just gives them the opportunity to bring something back through the process. Absolutely correct. Okay. So they don't have the ability to go through a variance or a plan development. So this is their only mechanism. It would need to go through site plan review committee a neighborhood meeting, planning board, and back to this commission for each um, special exception that would be applied for. Thank you. Uh, commission, any questions? Move no. approval. Second. We've been seconded. I will ask uh, Jessica, is there anything you want to put on the record? She's okay. Uh, any discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 9B. Ordinance number 2024-27, an ordinance approving the final plat for the Bradford Lake subdivision shown within phase four of the Plantation Oaks planned residential development, establishing conditions and expiration date of approval and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2024-27, read by title only. Thank you, Susan. I'll ask uh, Planning Director Steven Spraker to speak briefly on this one. Good evening, Steven Spraker, Planning Director. This is a request for a final plat. It is part of the Plantation Oaks uh, Plan re Residential Development. The overall Plantation Oaks development, their subdivision density is 1.71 units per acre. This individual phase is 80 lots on, on 53 acres. This is the overall subdivision that's located right here in the corner. They will build Pennsylvania in order to gain access. 
a uh, preliminary plat was approved in 2023. This is the last, last step, which will allow them to subdivide the land. The planning board did recommend approval of the application with a 60-0 vote, and the applicant is here if there are any questions. Thank you, Stephen. And this is a ministerial duty? Correct. Correct. Any approval. questions, Commissioner? Second. Moved and seconded. Please call the vote. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 9C. Ordinance number 2024-28, an ordinance approving the final plat for the Bradford Park subdivision, establishing conditions and expiration date of approval and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2024-28, read by title only. Thank you. I don't have any cards. Any questions, Commission? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 9D. Ordinance number 2024-29, an ordinance changing the name of Halifax Street to Cliff Haven Court and Matanzas Street to Ridge Haven Avenue, said streets being located in the Ridge Haven subdivision area, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof, providing for transmittal and recording in the public records of Volusia County and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2024-29, read by title only. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I don't have any cards on 9D. Move approval. approval. Second. We've been seconded. Any discussion or questions? Please call the vote. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes, 9E. Resolution number 2024-133, a resolution authorizing the execution and issuance of a development order for a special exception to allow outdoor activity to include the permanent outdoor storage, display, and sales of merchandise at the Lowe's Home Improvement Store located at 1340 West Granada Boulevard, establishing conditions and expiration date of approval and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2024-133, read by title only. Thank you, Susan. And uh, I will ask our planning director, Stephen Spraker, to just brief us on this one. Again, Stephen Spraker, planning director. This is a, a special exception. The property is at 1340 West Granada Boulevard. This would be Granada at the top of the screen. And there is a large uh, conservation ease easement behind the property. The outdoor activity is at the front of the store and to the side of the store. In 2012, there was a special exception that allowed the outdoor display of goods and materials along the frontage of the store. Um, recently in this year, there was violations found by the special magistrate. The special exception before you tonight um, is to cure the special magistrate issue and to bring the site into compliance. On August 20th, there was a special exception that was presented to the planning to the city commission. Planning board did recommend approval of this special exception. The uh, August proposal had the outdoor uh, goods and services in front of the store, and then to the side, they were using it for mulch and outdoor storage with a gate um, located in front of that. There was concern expressed at the city commission, and the applicant went back, heard the concerns of the commission and brought forward a new proposal. So this would be the front of the store located um, kind of in the center of the screen. They still maintain the outdoor um, goods and services along the frontage that they've had since 2012. And they've tightened up the outdoor storage of where the parking area is. And they've placed um, two 10 foot um, extensions of their garden center in essence to frame the outdoor storage. And then they would have the ability to go around either for private vehicles or for emergency um, services to access the rear of the property. The staff report um, provided what the applicant had done in terms of changing the site plan. Um, in the front of it, they have, again, put 10-foot um, gates to match the garden center. They're also placing landscaping in front. There are four uh, parking spaces that are proposed. That would be used if you were uh, quickly going into the outdoor area, if you're picking up a bag or two of mulch you could park here get it and then go again you still have the ability to go to the back and then this side is also screened 
This is the landscape update that they've done. Um, they're also working with our landscape architect to refresh the front buffer along Granada to replace some of that landscape material. And then this is the style of the fence that would go around the proposed outdoor storage. The applicant is here um, to address the commission. Then the planning board recommended approval with the conditions that are in your staff report and in the resolution. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions for Stephen? Not for Stephen. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Posey's here on behalf of the applicant. We'll recognize Joey Posey from Storch Law. Good evening, Joey Posey, 420 South Nova. I, I pretty much, Stephen, summed it up. I, I think the things that we're really happy with is actually the site's function is a lot better than it currently is because it forces all those folks that want to do the big uh, pickups and deliveries, they got to go to the back. Can't see them. Uh, the other thing I think that's nice here is that you really have a nice landscaping as you come into the site, which isn't currently there. Even if we sat with the existing conditions, it wouldn't be there. Um, so it, it's just a better function of the property. And, you know, we do really appreciate it and we're trying to make this work to, as we, we recognize the concerns and, you know, at least Lowe's is trying to be responsive to hearing what the commission has to say and especially that visual buffer that is, uh, you know, in front of the store there because that's important. So we understand that. So if there's anything I can do to, uh, to address it at this point, uh, you know, I think we ended up in a better place, but uh, I'm happy and I'm here to listen and answer any questions. Thank you. And Commissioner Tolland for Attorney Posey. So I just want to say thank you. We, we did, um, Mr. Posey and I did have a nice conversation regarding the proposed plan, so thank you for reaching out. Um, I do appreciate you um, looking at refreshing the landscaping. Yes. That's definitely imperative. Um, what I, my question, and, and we th I thought about this after our conversation, is the is there any concern with pedestrian safety behind the gate when you have cars coming through picking up? And, and is there going to be a mix of pedestrian cars that we need to be concerned about? So. I don't imagine so, but I would probably defer to our site engineer on that question. But I, I... And I'm sorry I didn't no, think about it when point. we were having our conversation. Excuse me, I've lost my voice this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, uh, Roger Stragola, 265 Kenworth Avenue. Um, really, the only pedestrian activity will be those four parking spaces. They would go through the... So they won't be walking through they, the they, whole thing. Going through the, Perfect. The that, was, that was my only concern. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Commissioner Persis. No, I just wanted to say um, I spoke with uh, Attorney Posey as well, and thank you for reaching out to me as well. And I just want to thank you for listening to us and, and making these changes. I think they're great. So thank you very much. Commissioner Sarge. I echo that. And I, I, I know that it came up before that there's a lot of managers that get changed in now there, and that sometimes that's a problem, the loss of communication, if hopefully there can be a memo or a memorandum in the their office that when someone new comes in that we don't put sheds out front near Granada. And, and where, where we've echoed the same concerns because uh, that's the line of communication is important and I think you're getting a much better response from the regional folks that say that we got to make sure that there's some institutional knowledge that stays with us when these issues come up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I appreciate what you've done with the sheds and, and the mulch and everything. I still have issues with the grills, the lawnmowers, and the plants. Um, if you can get those behind the gate, that'd be great as well because I got a phone call today about how unsightly the just the whole the whole row along the front of the store was. Now I didn't see it; I just got a phone call on it. But I still think you know I'd like to see the the grills and at least the lawnmowers back behind the gate. Maybe some plants out front in front of the garden center, but I think you know. Um, I just, you know, when we passed this in 2012, I was on the planning board and, um, you know, I thought it was okay then, but then I started seeing violations and it just continued. So if you could get, you know, get some of that clutter out from in front of the store and put it behind the fence, I'd be happy. And, and it's appreciated, Commissioner. I, I understand where you're coming from. And, and this is a delicate balancing act that I think I'm trying to do here because you know, from Lowe's perspective, this is this is their business, and this is something that I think is receptive to folks that come and go. You know, obviously there's maybe some disagreements from, you know, what may be unsightly or what may be their uh, you know their, their nature of how they advertise, 
um, in, that, in those kind of uh, aspects of it. But, you know, I'm, I, I think the things that we've done really well here are something that, you know, Lowe's, as much as it was a difficult conversation to have with them, was something we could get them to. And I'm hard pressed to say that I could get them to commit to something that goes against really what the, the nature of how they do business and especially since you know, they've, they've come to the table they said we've we've done the wrong we've made a wrong this time around and we want to make it right so well I think uh, it was really simple I mean when you have marked boxes where yeah. stuff is supposed to be and it's not inside the box right. you know Understood. They're, they're, they're going outside the lines so if they could do something with the, the grills and the, and the lawnmowers that'd be great I appreciate it and again, we're, we're happy to keep the dialogue going and make sure we can address it to the best of our ability because the, the goal is to, they want to be good good residents too, along with everybody else. Great. Commissioner Sargent. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hear what Deputy Mayor Briley's saying, but every Lowe's I've ever been to, every Home Depot I've ever been to has grills, lawnmower. I mean, it's part of their marketing strategy. Yeah. Um, I understand that you want to declutter it, but this is the way they operate business. They, that's how they sell their items. So I have a hard time with government coming in to tell them you can't have your product out there to sell your product when that's how their stores are nationwide, whether you go to a Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever it is. So um, I'm, I'm okay with it, Mr. Mayor, I, and I appreciate the um, everything that they've done to... And I appreciate that comment, but that was a special exception you were granted because the city doesn't allow that practice. We don't allow that practice. And that was a special exception granted to Lowe's, and you were given areas where it could be done and it started off fine, but then it kind of got out of control. And, and Commissioner, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. So I, again, I'm happy to pass along those comments because these folks want to do it the right way. It's just, you know, those incremental steps and in trying to balance this, you know, I, I've got, you know, that's, that's the tightrope I'm walking, but it, I do, I understand where you're coming from. Perfect. And Joey, we've got your number now. <laughs> I didn't get the, yeah your cell number. I didn't get to call you back today. No, I apologize, <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll get there. And I appreciate your willingness to continue the conversation. So thank you. All right. I have a question just yes, for Commissioner Briley. So if everything was contained within the squares, the you would be okay. If it were contained in the squares, okay. But uh, I just don't. You don't, don't believe have, I that I have they a lot can. of faith. So just as a reminder, we have done special exceptions for other businesses to show their products outside their doors in even smaller ones. So, you know, I think if they complied, I wouldn't have a problem with it at all. I do think it is a marketing strategy and I'm probably one of the biggest suckers when I walk into Lowe and grab a plant on the way, on the way in. So, you know, it works. So maybe if we can just work with compliance, that will be better. That would be good. All right. Any other questions? I do need a motion. Move approval. Second. We've been seconded. Any other discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? I'll be an apprehensive yes. Mayor Partington. Yes, and we will close the public hearings, move to 10A. Resolution number 2024-154, a resolution establishing fu fuel flowage fees, landing fees, and aircraft tie-down fees at the Ormond Beach Municipal Airport and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2024-154, read by title only. Thank you, Susan. I have. 18 cards on this one, but we're going to start with our economic development director, uh, Brian Rodemaker, and then possibly have Steve Licklider, the airport manager, as well. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, City Commission. The item before you today is uh, two items. One is to establish uh, landing fees at the uh, airport, and the second is to accept a uh, proposal uh, to adopt, to have Vector um, be the uh, company that handles the landing fees. As you know, the uh, Ormond Airport currently has a loan to the general fund of $999,852.20 for the local match that has been provided to the airport, which it has used uh, for its required airport improvement projects, which are used to keep the airport open 
as part of the national airspace system. The airport currently does not generate enough revenue uh, to, uh, through its existing tenants to uh, be self-sustaining following the direction of the commission in its effort to reduce our debt and to make the airport more self-sustaining the airport is proposing this landing fee it has been calculated upon the revenue needed by the airport to uh, maintain its estimated local cost share for planned and future capital improvement projects at the airport based on the the way that the landing fee is written uh, aircraft based at the airport are exempt from paying landing fees they are exempt because they pay, they, they pay a share of airport expenses through hangar rents, property taxes, et cetera. Not exempt itinerant aircraft will be required to pay the landing fees. Implementation in this form spreads the cost of operating and maintaining the airport to all users, not just those that are based at our airport. Again, landing fees will be used to cover the local share of airport capital improvement projects and to repay monies borrowed by the cities uh, from the airport by the city's general fund, which has been the primary way in which we've done airport projects. With regards to the second item, just to get that out there, the Vector Airport System service is in use at over 76 airports nationwide. Uh, the proposed contract was reviewed in accordance with our city procurement process. It was advertised uh, by the city on August 20 for 15 days. We did not receive any responses to the advertisement from other vendors. And again, the landing fee revenue will be used to cover our share of state and federal grants for capital improvement projects as we try to maintain this airport for the users of it. Stephen Licklider, airport manager, and I are available for questions that you may have. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Commissioner, I suggest we get through the uh, cards, and then yeah. if we have questions, we can move forward from there. Uh, Folks who are interested in speaking, we've got four seats up front here. I'd like to call four at a time and then uh, have you be ready on deck. So the first four will be Douglas Shin, Daryl Hickman, Terrence Perkins, and Patrick Murphy. start with Douglas Shin. My name is Douglas Shin. Uh, I'm not a resident presently of Ormond Beach. I grew up in Ormond. I do own a hangar, Hangar 88 out at uh, Ormond. And the points I would like to make on this are unintended consequences. I, as I understand, your FDOT and your FAA grants are somewhat determined and awarded by the number of operations at the airport. Uh, this landing fee will decrease those number of operations, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, you know, how was, people wonder how copper wire was, was formed. There's two pennies, or two pilots fighting for a penny. Um, but the tower operations costs are already funded 100% by the FAA. Again, if the operation numbers decrease, then the city is going to be on the hook for a good bit of those costs. So as the number of pilots are dissuaded from coming to Ormond Beach, then the operations will drop and then it may end up actually costing the city money instead of making the city money. And I haven't heard anybody discuss anything about what Vector's uh, estimates of the decrease in traffic are gonna be due to these landing fees. So. Um, I've talked to a number of pilots from other areas who use Ormond Airport, and they use it to come and visit businesses, not at the airport, but in Ormond. So again, this decrease will dissuade business instead of increasing business. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I think it's a mistake to try and impose landing fees. Uh, there are too many questions at this point unanswered. And I think there's better ways to increase the revenue at the airport. Thank you. Daryl Hickman. Daryl Hickman, 323 Verville Lane. I live in Ormond Beach. My wife owns a hangar at the airport, and I run a business out of there. 
Um, if you would take a few minutes to look on social media and look at the various pilot forums around the state, there is a call for a boycott of any airport that imposes these fees. That will directly affect my business. Uh, I receive more than 95% of my clients from outside of this area, outside of the state, and outside of this country. They come to Ormond Beach, they eat in Ormond Beach, they stay in Ormond Beach, their families stay here, they rent hotel rooms, and they patronize our restaurants. They will not come if you do this. Not because it will affect me directly, because I am apparently exempt from this policy, but just for the purposes of solidarity across this country with pilots. I do find it quite interesting that somehow we've determined that a $3 per thousand pound fee is what will pay back the $999,000 loan that you approved for the airport over these grants. That's interesting to me because it somehow mimics the other five airports that are cohorts in the same process. How all of them have the same debt load and the same $3 fee and the same amount of traffic to pay it off. And there's nothing said that when that fee is paid off that these, these landing fees will stop. So is this a perpetual revenue source for the city? I don't know if that's the case or not, but there's a lot of unanswered questions here. And the big question for me is why? Why did you agree to this debt and now all of a sudden you found a way to pay it back when we already pay fees. And as Mr. Shin said, you're going to reduce the traffic at this airport. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Murphy? Yes, okay. Patrick Murphy. I'm a resident of Orange City, but a vice president at Sunrise Aviation, which is the FBO and flight school out at the airport. Um, as has been mentioned, we realize that we are exempt from this, and I would tell that my position is kind of neutral because I understand the city's need to make money um, and to pay back uh, that debt, but also I also understand the fact that uh, flying, flight training, flying your own personal aircraft is already expensive. For us, I think the only effect is really, since we are the fueler at the airport, this may discourage people to come in and buy fuel. Um, but I think that's really the only negative thing. But I did want to come in and say that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Terrence Perkins. Good evening. I'm Terrence Perkins, uh, 108 Heritage Circle. So I've been a tenant out at the uh, airport since 1987. So I fly my airplane. I'm looking forward to flying it some more. All that I would ask is there are issues with regard to at what level does the city become responsible for the control tower out there? And there is a level. I remember we talked about that years ago. And so if you're looking at that and you're considering all of that, I, I really don't have an objection, but the airport is safer today than it was when I started flying because of what you did by getting us a control tower. And I would hate to see the financial obligation that is currently funded on a federal level revert to the city when the number of airplanes, which is what it's based on, um, decreases. So as long as you're looking at all of those pieces and considering all of those pieces, um, then I just want to maintain the control tower. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, I've got uh, Richard Isher, Isherwood, Gordon Arbeatman, Samantha Boyer, and Tony Arnaudis. Arnaudis. Forgive me on the names. Once we're done hearing from everybody, then we can go for a hundred things. Oh, okay. I think it's a good deal. Just so we get all the questions out. Richard? Yes, sir. Richard Isherwood. Uh, I live at uh, 1531 Poplar Drive. Uh, I have an aircraft at the, uh, the hangar. And I've, one thing you all look at is uh, the FAA funding that we get is based on the number of 
aircraft takeoffs and landings. If you institute this, you're going to lose a lot of takeoffs and landings. So you're going to lose some FAA funding. If you look at Umatilla, Umatilla was a just a grass strip. They went in, they kept track of it, they took care of people, they kept their costs down, they increased their count to the point where they paved runways, they built hangars, and I think there's other alternative ways you guys can make some money here. Rentals, hangar rentals. I was wait, looking for three years to find a hangar, and that's a steady income. Every month you're gonna get whatever you charge. So I think it's, it's this is a, ill-spent effort to tax each aircraft. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Gordon? You don't have to say what I say. All right. <laughs> I'm Gordon Arbeitman. and I live in Halifax uh, Plantation. And um, I've got an, air, on, uh, an airplane that I keep at the Ormandy Beach, uh, Beach Airport. Um, the only thing I want to talk about, uh, I'll probably be back to talk about Section B, but the only thing I want to talk about here is the, the process um, by which staff has presented this to all you folks. Um, it looks to me like what was presented to you was all of the talking points from this third-party company that wants to make money from us. They're not necessarily bad guys or anything, but they're in business to make money. They do not have the best interest of our city or our airport high on their priority list. And it sounds like the only thing that was presented in this public discussion by staff was their talking points. There is um, a lobbying organization that represents pilots and aircraft owners called AOPA, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. They are delighted to sit down with staff at any time from any airport and talk about what the trade-offs are of something like this. They're opposed to it, but and you don't have to listen to them, but it seems to me that staff doing its proper job to educate you would give you both sides of this. And staff has not spoken with AOPA before coming forward with this, and that makes no sense at all to me. Uh, I think the AOPA should meet with staff and possibly have their representative come down here to speak with you all and, and be questioned. And she would be happy to do that and I'd be happy to make that contact if, if you think that's appropriate. But that seems like a logical process to keep you informed to make the intelligent decision. Your goal, protect the city, protect the airport, balance the budget, right? That's fairly straightforward. That goal doesn't mesh 100% with vectors, nor does it mesh 100% with AOPAs. So I would think you'd want to hear from both sides through staff or directly rather than just one. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Samantha Boyer. I'm Samantha Boyer. I live in Ormond by the Sea. Like many others, I have an aircraft at Ormond Beach where it's called home for about eight years. I am an associate professor of aeronautical science, um, and I'm going to approach this conversation a little bit differently than I think some of my, my fellow pilots. Um, one of the one topic that I want to talk about with Vic Vector and how they plan on implementing the landing fees is through ADSB data. That's the data that they're going to collect on who we are and if we're based there or not. Um, that data and that tool was implemented by the FAA to improve safety. Ormond Beach's airspace does not require ADSB data to be used. It would be very easy for many of us to turn it off while we're in there, which would actually pose a major safety concern. Um, and I'd be curious on how that would work at a lot of other airports that are looking at this as well. Um, so that's my number one concern, is the increase of safety concerns that would occur, especially with the increased amount of traffic that we have with specifically student pilots in the area. Um, I also want to talk about the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2024 that was approved earlier this summer. One of the items in that very, very long act um, includes that 
the FAA and Congress have agreed that you cannot initiate any sort of investigation based on ADSB data alone. I would argue that imposing fines and fees based on this data is a similar overreach of government um, protocol. I find that highly irresponsible and I find it a, a door with unintended consequences like one of our peers talked about earlier as well. Um, my third comment that I would like to make before offering a suggestion, because um, I don't like to complain without offering a solution, um, is that the United States model with general aviation, which is consumed my entire adult life and my entire profession, is that we don't want to do landing fees. We want to protect general aviation in order to promote the most safe and efficient aviation industry in the world, which is the FAA's model. Um, imposing landing fees is going to take away from that. We're also going to increase the already very expensive industry in which we operate, which would also discourage a lot of international students who come here in order to train and gain some of the most valuable training that they're going to receive in their professional careers. My solution is that you really need to work on attracting businesses, filling that golf course that has now been vacant for years with other opportunities to encourage pilots that are coming to our airport for more than just practice landings, because I think that's the concern. Um, promoting events, educational facilities, air shows, car shows, that would encourage people to come and spend money in our city, on our airport property, and help fund the needed that we need. Thank you. Tony Arnudis. Good evening. Good evening. Tony Arnaldes, I live in Tiffany, uh, 17 Tiffany Circle, up the street from here. I'm going to give you a different angle. I'm an immigrant, legal all the way. I was born and raised in Greece. My father was a jet fighter pilot. I learned how to fly when I was six. My utmost dream was to become a pilot in Greece and have an airplane. Impossible. User fees, taxes, and all the other stuff that happens on, which is you're about to implement here, this allowed me from this. So I'm a physical therapist. Uh, I came here when I was 27. I was a teacher, another industry that does not work very well in the United States. I became a physical therapist, and financially, I could afford to get an aeroplane. In 1998, uh, from Sunrise Aviation, I got my pilot's license. I own an aeroplane and a hangar. I'm exempt from this rule. But there is a thing here that nobody sees real good. Is the United States of America the first nation in the world? In what? How about number of prisoners? How about education? Not very much. How about aviation? Right? Why? Because we're allowed to operate aircraft freely. We can land anywhere we want to. And all my friends in Greece, when I go there on vacation, they say, so you can go anywhere you want to and nobody can. No. I have six friends, personal friends, that came to Emirate, got their pilot's license, work for Greek aviation industry, and they live in the United States of America because of this, because they like to fly airplanes. If this gets implemented, might as well go back to Greece. Uh, my dream is to fly in my small general aviation aircraft back to Greece. And there is companies that will book this for you. You know how much I'm going to pay in user fees flying from here to Greece? $6,000. It's almost equal to the fuel I will, play, I will pay to fly there. Not a good thing, gentlemen. Please do not do this. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Daly, Robert Fox, Bob Brown, and Ron Sarah. Sean, you can come on up to the mic. Sir, thank you. And you can start while they're coming up. Sure, I, I think I'm going to be alone anyway. So, uh, Sean Daly again, Northbrook. I have the unique uh, situation of I've owned my property for 45 years in Northbrook, 
If you draw a straight line from the east-west runway, it goes right over my house. And I can tell you that because of the number of planes that buzz my house every day. Now, I will tell you again, I don't have a problem with our airport. What I have a problem with is Daytona flight schools. And when some, these folks are complaining about operations going down, 95, 90 to 95% of operations at our airport are Daytona flight schools. You think they're not gonna come for $10? No, they don't have anywhere else to go. As a matter of fact, they're gonna come, they're just gonna pass on that expense as a part of the t curriculum or tuition for their students. It's just a cost of doing business. A million dollars of taxpayer money has been spent on some place that's used by very few people. Now, I understand they all wanna have their place for their airplane, I think that's great. I'm pretty sure you're a lot of smart people. In the last 15 years that this has been a problem because the airport has never paid for itself, ever. Even when the golf course was running, it didn't pay for itself, never. So I think if you could find another way to squeeze money out of that place, you would have done it. You're not gonna put hangar space there to fill enough, to raise enough money to pay off this debt. You have a responsibility to the citizens, most of whom, as I will again refer to the survey that was done 10 or 15 years ago, don't think the airport is that important. I recognize to a lot of other folks, it's very important. But they don't even, those folks aren't even gonna pay. So do you think anybody's not gonna fly here because of 10, that's less than it costs to go on the beach every day, $10. And I don't, I'm just thinking $10, $5 operations. I can tell you that the Daytona flight schools, despite our noise abatement policy, routinely violate it every day. We have a simple policy, for instance. You're not supposed to be doing flight training before 8 a.m. You know what? Phoenix East Aviation could care less about that. On a routine basis, they put four or five planes there. Sometimes it's 6.30 in the morning. And why am I so passionate about this? because my wife was very ill for a long time on chemotherapy. You know, you can't sleep all the time when you want to. But did they care? I called them, I called Embry-Riddle, I called our people. We can't do anything about that. And you know why they're constantly flying over? Because they shove six planes at a time into our tiny little airport. And those planes are going around and around 10 times. So if they want to do that, make them pay. I'm tired of paying. I don't think the citizens want to pay. Thank you, Sean. Robert, Robert Fox, did I get that right? Oh, Ron Sarah. I've got you too. Ron, go ahead. Okay. Good evening, commissioners, uh, city attorney, city managers. My name is Ron Sarah, and uh, I appreciate your service, obviously. But I fundamentally disagree with the implementation of uh, these landing fees. And it must be divine in intervention that I'm coming up after this young, that young man. I apologize for your wife. Um, but uh, I've been here since 1978 and uh, went to college here. I taught college here, taught at Daytona State, taught at uh, Embry-Riddle. I now teach at Purdue uh, online. I was an FHP trooper here, Troop D. So uh, my wife was a 30-year-old uh, state attorney. 5th DCA, 7th Circuit, so I have a big connection to this community. My son now is a Delta Legacy pilot, and anybody in this room would be happy and lucky to be on his 737 flying out of Daytona uh, Beach International Airport. Why? Because he trained here in our infrastructure with our flight instructors. Okay, that's why we have, we have the mecca of flight training. And these people behind me, they've dedicated their lives, lives, 30, 40 years to make it that way. Um, let me just give you some quick uh, statistics. Uh, each flight school brings it any, anywhere between one to six million dollars into this community. The Florida Department of Transportation says that general aviation and flight training brings in eight billion, that's billion with a B, okay? Every dollar spent at that airport, two dollars is spent into the, into the uh, community. Uh, I know other people are going to talk about safety issues, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Uh, what I am going to talk about is our competition. 
Our competition right now is going to be Arizona, Texas, and the Midwest. They're looking to see uh, what, what Florida does because they want the, our students. They want them. They want them there because they want part of that $8 billion income coming and pumping into this economy. Um, let me explain also that I teach online. Somebody talked about the social media. We come from a different generation, folks. We come from a generation that our reputation, if, if you did something, it's going to take years before we see that effect. Now, it's months and days. Let me give you an example. I have 100 students in my seminar every Tuesday night. Those 100 students on Purdue University are all aviation-related people. I have about 12 of them who train here. Purdue has a totally different model than Emmy Riddle. They put their students all over the United States at approved flight schools. So I have students all over. I have 12 people here who are flight training, and they say in the class discussion, Professor, what's going on with these flight training, with these uh, landing fees? This is going to put another uh, five to six thousand dollars onto my bill. Immediately, a hundred of those students are all talking about flight landing fees in Daytona Beach area. Orman. Okay. Um, Next is Bob Brown. Thank you. Sorry. Nope. Do we have one, one question? Do I have one question? If I'm also on 10B, do I have another th uh, three minutes? You would if we get there. Yes, okay. sir. Bob Brown. <laughs> Mayor, commissioners. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Tolley, I think that's your zone. It is my zone. Yes. Um, I'd like to give you a couple of uh, things to think about when you're, when you're talking about these landing fees. One, it, it's, it's not a good idea that you have them rolled into uh, the same ordinance with the hangar fees and the tie downs. Those are property values that you, you're going to have to uh, look at. Um, but the landing fees are, are an issue that are, are separate all to their own. Uh, this is something that this company has come up to sell us and, and they've given the airport managers a good spiel to give to you guys, but it's not good enough. Uh, there are issues with it. They're sweetening the deal to make you think that it's, it's okay by giving it um, a free ride for your, your tenants. You know, you're not, you're not charging them any fees. You're only charging the, the transient people that are flying into the airport. Um, I believe that they also said that uh, the businesses and the tenants can also give vouchers to the, the people that are flying in so that they are exempt. Uh, if your tenants are doing a good job and they're exempting their business people that are visiting them, nobody's going to collect any fees. Uh, from the simple thing that uh, if you go to the FBO and you buy a bottle of water, is that acceptable? Is that a, a good visit to a business? Uh, the, the airplanes that come to the airfield and buy fuel, is that a good business uh, stop to where somebody's going to be exempt? Uh, there's a lot of things to, to think about how that fee is going to be collected. Who's going to take the complaints? Is that going to be you guys or is it going to be vector? There's a lot to think about. The other thing is that uh, these, the, the, the runways are designed to hold thousands and thousands of pounds, 30,000, 40,000. Uh, these little small airplanes that we're talking about taxing with, with landing fees weigh less than your car does. They're not the ones that are destroying the, the runways, the taxiways. The, the other thing is, is if, you, if you're going to make this equal for everybody, uh, if you exempt people here at home, you need to exempt everybody. You exempt one, you got to exempt them all. So this exemption is eventually going to go away. We're all going to get hit with this fee. Um, it's, it's bad because we're also doing the same thing with helicopters. Helicopters Thank don't, you. don't yep. do anything, any damage to runways. Thank you. Yep. We're going to go to...
Matthew Sarah, Sharon Sarah, David Gall, and Terrence Anderson. Matthew, you're up first. Hello, Mayor, Commissioners. First thing I want to explain why I'm qualified to speak to you all today. Uh, firstly, I'm an airline pilot for a prominent airline based in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, a legacy airline. I'm a, I'm, and I'm a professor for Purdue University. I want to paint a picture of a young boy and a young family trying to make ends meet with their small flight school. That's what we did, operating on paper thin margins. Um, this will enable those margins to become even tighter than what they are today. Um, they'll be so tight you will not have family run businesses operating at the, or the Ormond, Daytona, all of the, the airports that implement these, these fees. So I, I can guarantee you that not only will this get rid of family businesses, it's anti-family. Safety is also a major concern. Let's talk about the 737 MAX crash. Um, this shook the world, federal news, or um, this was worldwide news. And it was partly to blame with pilots that were not qualified and did not have the experience to operate that 737 aircraft. I'm a 737 pilot. I know that the person next to me, I want to be incredibly qualified to do the job that they're supposed to do. By implementing these fees, this is gonna make it so pilots try to avoid having reps, landings, doing this um, uh, more, getting more practice in the aircraft so that when they go to the airlines, they have the experience to operate these aircraft. Let's talk about the Laffer Curve since I also am a, a financial professor. Laffer Curve is a Reagan era economic policy. As we increase taxes, increase fees, we know for a fact that revenue for the government is going to decrease. I can guarantee you that these fees will not cause an increase in revenue. My wonderful fiance behind me, Bella, she is a, uh, a new flight instructor here in the Daytona Beach area operating over in Phoenix East. She has $180,000 of debt and she is the perfect student. Zero check ride failures, zero. That's unheard of. So do you want to make that $280,000 of debt? They won't do it. So this pilot shortage that you see in federal news, worldwide news, this will become even worse. This is going to affect our aviation industry as a whole. I guarantee it. So if you do pass this, I want to at least see an exemption for aircraft under 6,000 pounds. There is precedent for this in other airports. I hope you do not accept this, these fees at all, but please, please consider the legislation and the, the minutia detail here, and please ask, ask the experts. Thank you. Sharon, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sharon, Sarah, and that's my boy. <laughs> it's his birthday, and he came here. <laughs> um, I just want to start out. I've been an attorney, not a 30-year-old attorney, but a 30-year attorney, as you can see by my white hair. <laughs> First, I want to ask that the commission um, remove the landing fees from this ordinance to have further research into how to impose these fees, who to impose them on, if at all. Um, if you take a look at Tallahassee, Tallahassee has the fees. Vector, of course, is the only player in all of these uh, airports. And they are exempting any aircraft that is under 6,000 pounds because any aircraft under 6,000 pounds isn't causing any kind of damage to that airport. And it's very important that we pay attention to what is going to happen with regards to the aviation industry across the United States, not just in Florida, but Florida will be impacted considerably. Um, as an attorney, I'm concerned about antitrust laws um, being violated. The, they are supposed to be reasonable. These fees are supposed to be created from reasonable and non-discriminatory methodology. Um, here we've got four or five airports right now that are getting together through Vector apparently, and they are setting, they are price fixing these fees rather than seeing what their individual needs are, and how 
each player that comes into the airport is using the airport. You may have a percentage, a high per higher percentage of different types of traffic. You have to see what that traffic does and how it impacts before you set a fee. Now, we also want to take a look at 49 USCA 41116, and that has to do with reasonableness. Is this reason, is it reasonably, re is what the, the, the pilot, the majority of pilots who are going to experience these fees, is it related to their usage of your airport? And if it's not, then there's a problem, and that's why Tallahassee chose 6,000 pounds or greater to impose the fees because those are corporate pilots. Those are the big planes. Those are 10,000 pounds land pounding on your, uh, your runways and your taxiways. That's causing your problems. I would hope that <coughs> in the event that you actually pass this ordinance and include the landing fees, hopefully you will not, um, that you also, I would respect, respectfully request that the proposed landing ski the <coughs> schedule be pulled from the ordinance pending more research. A landing fee schedule must be non-discriminatory, must be reasonable, and it's vital for the landing fee schedule not to interfere, interfere federally preempted controlled airspace. Thanks. Thank you. David Gall. Please indulge me, I'm very nervous and dry mouth. I don't speak well in public. Um, my name is David Gall. I'm from Port Orange, Florida. I learned to fly in Vero Beach in 1977, 47 years of pilot. I've been a member of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association since 1985, the largest organization of its kind worldwide. I was an air traffic controller for 34 years. I started out in Vero Beach in its busiest heyday when they did twice the traffic that this airport does. I worked at Orlando Executive and the Northern California Tracon, which at one time was the busiest Tracon in the nation. While I was in California, I watched general aviation die. It just died out there because of user fees, because of cities that didn't appreciate the value of the airport that they had. I'm an Embry-Riddle alumnus. I'm a University of Central Florida aerospace engineering graduate. And I flew as an airline pilot for three and a half years under United Delta and Alaska Airlines banners as a SkyWest Airlines pilot. I'm also a flight instructor teaching my own kids to fly. I have a 1971 Cessna 150 that cost me about $40,000 for a 50-something year old airplane. That's a pretty big chunk of change. Out of that $40,000, I had to add $5,000 worth of ADS-B equipment to this airplane in order to comply with the federal requirement for ADS-B. In order to fly in Central Florida airspace, you need that. The airplane is equivalent to an old Volkswagen Beetle that a guy my age might have driven to high school. It cost me about $30 per hour to operate that airplane. And if I can do 10 takeoffs and landings in an hour, which is quite a reasonable amount of takeoffs and landings, I can teach my kids to fly. 10 takeoffs and landings at $3 per thousand pounds is $60 per hour for takeoff and landing practice, which is double my operating cost for the airplane. You've just tripled my cost to teach my kids how to fly. I'm not doing this commercially. I'm not Embry-Riddle, I'm not a big flight school. I just want to teach my own kids to fly like you guys teach your kids to drive. Do they charge you $10 to go around the block every time on a public street? No, this is public infrastructure. It's here for the benefit of all of us, and it does benefit all of us. This proposal would triple my direct hourly operating costs, and I'd like to rebut to the staff that it's ludicrous to advertise a bid locally for 15 days when the known vendor who instigated this proposal is not even a U.S. corporation, but a German corporation. If you're going to advertise locally and your one vendor is from out of the country, maybe you should advertise your bid for a little bit longer and outside of the state. I'm not going to have time to get through all of this. I'm sorry. Um, I don't think this proposal fits in with the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems or the Florida Airport System Plan. If your staff did not brief you on these things and how Ormond Beach Airport fits into these plans, I suggest you withdraw this plan, spend more time with staff, find out where this airport fits in the plan, and make it fit. I've got twice as much to say. I'm sorry. Thank you. Terrence Anderson followed by Michael Galuzzi. 
First of all, I'm going to cut this short because um, of the time limit. And plus, most, most people have said a lot of the things I'm going to say anyway, but I still have plenty of talking points for this. First of all, one of the gentlemen was complaining about the, the airspace people flying around and over their houses and things. I live in Long Beach. I'm a resident. I, and in fact, I probably pay more taxes than him. I don't know. But I, I'm pretty happy. I'm, I stay in Plantation Bay. My taxes are high. I don't care if they fly over. I prefer them to fly over. Secondly, um, this landing fee thing um, affects the, the landing. Just like the pilot was saying here about the 737s and things. Um, most people don't under realize when you get on that plane yourself, those pilots are required to cut the autopilot off once they get so close to the ground. There's only there are, the planes are required if they're equipped to do uh, autopilot all the way to the ground, and it's only once a month for most of those planes that are equipped to do that. But the ones that have to do it physically, you have to cut that autopilot off and be able to fly that plane to the ground. That's why it's so important for them to know how to land that plane. The most dangerous portion of flight is the landing phase. More people get killed landing than any other, any other type of accident. And if they don't know how to land that plane and you start shortening up their curriculum to save money, that means there's going to be less training in them landing that plane. If I don't know how to land that plane, guess what? I'm crashing in your house. Kill your kids. Kill your wife. Kill you. So I think that's very important for them to be able to land these planes and to land them uh, 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 safely. And, and the pattern, and what we call the pattern, when you fly around and around and around, it teaches you more phases of flight than anything else because you get your ascents, your descents, your turns, your banks, everything is in that, in that pattern. So um, that's a very important uh, phase of flight. And as far as I'm saying that it's, it's, it's you know, they're, they're buzzing over the house and stuff, Ormond Beach sits under a shelf, under the Daytona International shelf, um, a Class C shelf. It's 1,200 feet where it starts. The, the uh, pattern altitude is only 1,100 feet due to the altitude. So that means that gives them 100 feet. They have to stay low to, to not violate that space. So that's, if he doesn't understand that, that's why. They have, you know, you give this noise and things. Um, but again, that, that, uh, that landing is very important for them to learn how to do this because they can't do it. As far as going to the airlines and they cut that airplane off, if they can't do it by hand, guess what? Somebody's going to get killed. Michael uh, Galuzzi followed by Andre May. Okay, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> Councilman, thank you very much. I appreciate having me, uh, give me the opportunity to speak. I figured I'd corral all the birds in one pond. I had intentions of reaching out to you um, on behalf of NASA. I work for NASA Aeronautics Research in uh, Center, um, the NASA Aeronautics Research Institute at Ames Research in Moffett Field, uh, specializing in adva advanced air mobility and researching and particularly recently the commercialization or the transfer of that technology into general aviation. What I want to do is uh, share with you some of my research. I think it might help with some of the empirical data and review to assess where your situation is at this point. And, I, I, and this is something we really offer a proposal, if you will. Um, so there's no doubt. Uh, operations, what we call air operations, flight operations or flights is, have increased tremendously here. Uh, per the FAA database, or ADIC, and the uh, ADIP, you're looking at over 7 million flights in the Central Florida area. Um, that's obviously exacerbated by other itinerant, we'll call transient traffic, and local tenant traffic. So <clears throat> the high volume, of course, I mentioned, I heard uh, noise abatement issues or noise concerns. Um, and this has been well documented. The most recent study that New Smyrna Beach Airport actually did uh, which is titled Operating Cost Recovery Strategies for the New Smyrna Beach Airport, and it's by Dr. Uh, Beyer. And that, that's publicly recently a release, so I'd employ you to research and read that. Okay, so point is, as I mentioned before, I'm looking and reviewing the a, what we call AAM technologies, advanced air mobility. This is the, what we call it, uh, electric, electric vehicle, EV aircraft, EVOL, if you've heard of the term. So why does this matter? So we think, we NASA, the NARI group 
feel this area is a beautiful microcosm of what a future AAM environment would look like. It's an integration of autonomous vehicles with general aviation. Um, what we want to do essentially is propose, essentially, um, a number of things. One of the things I mentioned before looking at the commercialization effort, we're concerned, our research is finding and proving out that things like uh, landing fees, um, the approach that collecting the fees through ADSB is a number of issues with this, like unwarranted surveillance using ADSB is not intended. That may go away. We're looking to have part of our partners with FAA to terminate that. Um, it's also a um, issue of publishing personal identifiable information, or PII. Our proposal is this real quick in 10 seconds. We want to leverage the 2024 Airport Improvement Program, or AIP, the grant that's over $5 billion to get into a PPP or public private partnership with you. Um, essentially, we want to work with other airports, FAA, AOPA, and you, and other regional airports to, to investigate further Thank the you. transfer of this technology. Appreciate that. Appreciate yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Andre May. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, let me give you a little bit back my background. Um, for about 35 years, I worked with uh, one of the largest international flight schools in Central Florida. We were accredited. Um, during that time, I was running admissions for 15 years, accreditation for 23 years, the VA immigrations for 34 years. And the demographic of the school was pretty much 70% international. We had about 60, 80 countries we used to come down. In the U.S., obviously, given the pilot shortage, has been increasing, so that's been a good thing. We're excited about that. Um, one of the things that people don't see, and I know Ron and uh, a lot of people coming up and actually talking about what's actually happening, is that Europe and the rest of the world charges so many fees that the United States really is number one in pilot training around where everybody comes here because it's cheaper. And believe me, it's not cheap. It's gotten very expensive over the years. And I know we always talk about how many landings we got. So I did a little bit of research on how many landings they're actually involved. Because I know we always talk about, well, how bad is it? You know, it's like $3. Well, no, the, the trainer that everybody uses, like a typical Piper Archer or 172, you know, by the time you have the fuel and everybody's on board, it's, it's uh, around 24, 2,500 pounds. So you're looking at $6 per landing. So let's talk about how many landings we got. So. With the help of AI, I went on and started looking. And we're looking at uh, up to 150 landings for a private, 70 for an instrument, 150 for a commercial. Those are just three courses you get done in a year, right? Then you got your CFI is another 100. You got your double I, uh, your second instructor course, which is 50, and then your multi-engine, which is 20. So you're looking at a spread of anywhere from 365 to 540 landings. And, and like they're talking about the safety effort of it, is that practice makes perfect. And I can tell you, I've seen kids run out of money and they push their instructors to sign them off for the check ride and they're not ready. And what happens is they're desperate to finish the training and run out of money. And what's gonna happen is, is when the word is out, like Ron is saying, when the word is out and these kids talk and they talk really easy, the kids are not gonna come. And I can tell you, uh, years ago, I worked on a project with Dick Harkey, who is the congressional aide to Congressman John Mike, who was signed this district many years ago. And there was a potential a lot of these flight schools were going to lose this one visa. And so Dick Harkey came up with a great idea. He said, Andre, tell me the economic impact for the state of Florida. So I ended up being a point person for the United States to find out what was going to be against. So I was working with all the flight schools across the country and the flight schools in Florida. Make a long story short, it was like Ron said, it was in the billions. So I get it, these guys come in and they like, hey listen, I'll take care of your problem. I know you've got money you need for the airport, you got to fix it, you guys don't have to do a thing. And then the airport manager is like, hey, I don't have to do a thing. These guys are gonna do it all for us. We're gonna use this ADSB information and all the pilots there, so then they're all pilots, every time they come in, they're gonna have to pay. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks for your time. Yes, sir. I had one card for Robert Fox, I guess, did he leave or wave? Fox or Jex? Jex, thank you. That's me, sir. Sorry about like that. <clears throat> I did ask somebody and they agreed that with me. I, yeah, it looked like Fox. I, I, I tell the guys it's like Tex with a 
J. Gotcha. I say something else to the ladies. They giggle and they remember. <laughs> okay. I'll keep my remarks very brief. Uh, three minutes is not enough to do justice to this highly controversial proposal. So as the last speaker, I suppose, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak my first and hopefully not my last. I will summarize what others have brought forth to the table tonight for consideration in closing. This proposal is not ready for prime time and may never be. It will not improve safety. It will not improve pilot production in an industry that desperately needs more pilots. It will not improve revenues at the airport in the long term. In the short term it will until people get the word that Ormond Beach is charging a landing fee for, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Director, each and every landing. He's not shaking his head yes. Each and every landing will generate a user fee. Let me mention something. This may be not necessarily an illegal proposal, but perhaps an immoral one. It is based on the use of a technology, a relatively new technology, called ADSB, Added Aircraft Dependent, Attitude Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. It is transponder on steroids. It is designed for an ATC safety enhancement function. It is not, repeat, not intended to generate fees for landing of aircraft, whether they're based there or not. It also cannot distinguish whether the aircraft did a touch and go or a low approach. I submit to you this policy is discriminatory. It definitely takes the training community to task for visiting airports, which is a required part of their training, and unnecessarily burdens them with additional fees that will discourage, not encourage, discourage the use of the airport in the future. I submit to you there are more positive ways to approach the generation of airport revenue. As commissioners, of course, you need to be thinking about how to raise money in the long term. I get that. Let's talk about generating businesses that the public wants to come to Ormond Beach Airport and use. Perhaps an aircraft overhaul service, an engine shop, a propeller shop. We have a, a helicopter training facility, a helicopter repair facility that doesn't yet exist. Let's take the high road on this, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, and generate businesses at the airport that the aviation public wants to use. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Commission, I think you were copied on a letter I received from Stacy Heaton, who is the Southern Regional Manager for AOPA, an Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association. I sent that to our city clerk and asked that she make that part of the record. On this matter, it uh, covers many of the points that have been made tonight, also has a lot of uh, stats and information in it. Um, and Commission, we can now uh, go to discussion Do you want a on 10A or if there's a motion. I'll, sure. I'll move for discussion. Well, I'll second for discussion. Okay. Moved and seconded. And we'll start with you, Commissioner Sargent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I have lots of comments, but I think I'll keep it brief. Uh, thank you to the residents for coming out. Um, back in October 6th of 2015 at the Airport Master Plan Update Workshop, Commissioner Boehm at the time noted that he read that we were only in $177,000 in debt. So that kind of answers where you thought about nine years ago. Here we are nine years later and we're operating at over a million dollars in debt. We're looking at ways to um, explore this. So I, I have a question for staff. Was this item presented to the Aviation Advisory Board? Uh, we did not yet bring this before the Aviation Advisory Board when the decision to bring the item before the commission was made, we started to move this forward with the expectation to talk to them about it at their next meeting this fall. Well, I think it's important that we would have them advise us before we are making a decision on something. That's why we have an, an 
and Aviation Advisory Board. Um, and let me be clear, I'm not a no on charging a fee, but I think we need to look at everything, look at all the options. And here we are, several months ago I said I would, I would appreciate if we had an Aviation Advisory Board that met more than as needed when we are operating at a negative million dollars um, in the red. With that, Mr. Mayor, I mean, I have a lot of other comments I could make. Um, for the record, I did speak with Stacy um, from AOP. I met with several pilots out of the hangar at Frank Bullard's hangars uh, on Monday. Um, I would like to make a motion to table this item and the next item, Mr. Mayor. I second that. All right. Did you want to withdraw your motion on uh, 10A? Because we had a motion and a second for discussion. Yes, I'll withdraw my motion on 10A and make a motion. And the seconder will withdraw? I forget. Yeah, I second. Sorry. Okay. Our second. I'll withdraw. Perfect. Then I'll make a motion to table items, uh, resolutions 10A and 10B. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Any issue with that, Randy? Uh, <clears throat> no, just for clarification, is it your attention that the item be um, <clears throat> presented to the Aviation Advisory Board before it comes back to the Commission, or what, what exactly are you directing staff to do? Yes, I would like to direct staff to, uh, let's go with the process, have the Aviation Advisory Board review this and advise us accordingly. Is there anything else? I just wanted to say something. Anything else? No, Mr. Mayor. And the seconder is okay with that addition? Yeah, I just want to say, is it, may I say something? Sure. I just wanted to say I have so many questions, and um, I am glad that, um, Commissioner Sargent, that you said what you've said and withdrawn everything. I There are so many questions about this. This is a huge decision. So I think we need lots more time to learn about this issue, um, even more so that what's in our agenda. It just doesn't answer all my questions. I was, I've been sitting here writing down questions, and I have so many. So thank you for doing that. Commissioner Tolland. No, that's not how we do it, sir. Commissioner Tolland. So I came in here after, you know, doing my research, talking so, to some pilots and thinking that this was absolutely the right thing to do um, because it will fill that hole in the airport, you know, fund. Um, but obviously I learned a lot tonight. And what I learned is this process of comments and coming up and speaking to us works and at least in the fact that it gives us the opportunity to question of, of those people that are experts in the field and not just what we can read and try to find out on our own so I appreciate all the time that you guys spent in coming to the podium that's not always an easy thing to do and I 100% respect the one gentleman that said he doesn't speak well in public. First time I came here, I tried to promote a community garden. I about threw up after I talked to the commission and went home, and here I am. So it's still, I'm still not comfortable, but that's okay. So I appreciate, uh, Commissioner Sargent, you have been talking about using our advisory boards, not just the Aviation Advisory Board, but our advisory boards better. I think this is the perfect example of, of where we failed in that respect. And I'm really looking forward to coming back after it's seen at the Aviation Advisory Board and getting some of those answers asked. Um, questions. Commissioner Sorgen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to, if there's anyone that's a Orman resident that would like to be on the Aviation Advisory Board. The applications are available online, and we normally do those in November after our election season. Yeah, check the website. It's on there now. If you need help, please email me or call me. Thank you. So this is a vote on the motion to continue 10A and 10B. Right. Mr. Mayor. Um, Deputy Mayor Bradley. I would like to state that, yeah, I, I do agree that I think our Aviation Advisory Board needs to review this first. Um, however, I do, com I do uh, concur with Mr. Daly uh, that you know, the airport's been running a deficit for many, many years, and it's, I don't think necessarily the city should keep subsidizing the airport and on the backs of the taxpayers. So I do want to throw that out there. 
but I do think it is worth our Aviation Advisory Board looking at this prior to coming back to the City Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Please call the vote. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Braley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 10C. Resolution number 2024-159, a resolution appointing a member and an alternate member to serve on the Opioid Abatement Funding Advisory Board, establishing term and conditions of service and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2024-159, read by title only. Thank you, uh, Susan. I don't have any cards on this item, and but I will state I'm currently serving on the Opioid Abatement advisory board uh, vice chair and I would have one more meeting I think it's October 4th and I would like to continue to see that through to the end essentially um, so Susan I'm not sure the best way to accomplish that um, mr. mayor I'd, I'd like to at least nominate uh, Commissioner Holland I second that Thank you. as the alternate member correct okay stole my thunder and I would thank you I would continue you guys are going to get a chance to do this again in November or December right. or right. whenever you make all these um, this, and I'm presumably sorry, Mayor. and this presumably is, Commissioner Tallon would then bump up possibly to the uh, rep but I would appreciate and be honored to be part of that opioid abatement awesome I know you've already thank been you. to many I've been meetings. to a few meetings watching so I'm be honored thank you so we have a motion and a second. Do you need anything else at this point, Susan? This appointment would be for two years, um, starting October 1st. So um, when I spoke to the representative from the county, she said we could either, um, Mayor, you would continue for the two years and we have an alternate, or we could appoint, reappoint you and then who would replace you and then also an alternate. I would. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. Uh, my intention is to serve out the remainder of of my term along with my mayoral duties and then there would be a vacancy i think at that point you would be able to the way i remember the rules yeah. being written because we voted on them as a as a board they would um, yeah i think commissioner Collins could you. be the alternate until uh, when when then when the mayor resigns or resigns from the board we could appoint commissioner tall as the primary right. member Thank you. Thank you. So please call the vote. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And thank you, Commissioner Tolland, for your willingness to serve. Uh, 10D. Resolution number 2024-160, a resolution accepting a proposal from Brown and Brown Insurance Services, Inc for the provision of property, liability, and workers' compensation insurance for various lines of insurance coverage through various insurance carriers, including property, inland marine, auto, physical damage, excess workers' compensation, crime, accidental death and dismemberment, police officers and firefighters, national flood insurance program, NFIP flood, pollution, professional liability, EMTs and paramedics, general liability, including law enforcement liability, tenant and user liability, TULIP, special events, cyber liability, and active shooter liability insurance, authorizing the execution of documents relative thereto, authorizing payment therefore, and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2024-160, read by title only. Thank you, Susan, and I'll ask our finance director, Kelly McGuire, to speak on this item. Thank you very much. We received two proposals for our insurance RFP. One was from Brown and Brown for $1.5 million, and the second one from Foundation Risk Partners, that was $1.65 million. Neither provided the flood insurance information because the rates were not available at the time that the proposals were open. We have received that since then, so that adds $20,000 to each of these two proposals. In addition to that, there were four coverages that we have listed here that Foundation Risk Partners did not quote specifically. They indicated that they would assume our existing coverage. So for purposes of doing an apples to apples comparison, you need to add approximately $30,000 for those four lines of coverage. And so there were two criteria that we used, price was one, 
with those additions, the flood insurance, and then taking to, into account approximately $30,000 for the four coverages that were not specifically quoted by Foundation Risk Partners. The difference is about $180,000 between Brown and Brown and FRP. So price was 50% of the criteria. Obviously, Brown and Brown received the 50% on that. The second criteria was qualifications. So we looked at not just the qualifications of the firms, but we looked at the qualifications of the underlying trusts. So Pidgeot and FMIT. The firms, both highly qualified, obviously. They've been in business a long time. Certainly, the individuals that are in those firms are highly qualified and capable of providing the services we need. We looked at the underlying insurance trusts, Pidgeot and FMIT. Both of those are financially sound firms capable of paying our claims. So for the purposes of qualifications, we deem them to be equal. So our recommendation to you is to award to Brown and Brown because they have the lowest premium. I'm happy to answer any questions, and we also have Steve Farmer here from Brown and Brown if you have questions on their proposal. Thank you, Kelly. If we have questions, we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. I would like to first just um, that I will be turning in my form A, abstaining from voting on this item as I work for an insurance company that's participated in the bid process. I did speak with uh, the Florida Ethics Commission who advised me that I could participate in conversation, but to abstain from voting. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Tallon. Yeah. I submitted my form to city clerk prior to the meeting. Um, I just want to put on record that I had contacted the Florida um, Ethics Commission and spoke with an attorney, Gray Schaefer, concerning this resolution. Um, he um, advised me that I may participate in discussion only and may not vote in the voting conflicts are cited on 112.3143, sub 3, and sub 4 of the Florida Statutes 2023. Thank you. So Deputy Mayor Briley, Commissioner Persis, and myself will be the only ones voting on this item. And uh, with that, we have four cards, starting with Tom Leak. Thank you. <clears throat> Just to make clear, I'm here in my capacity as the Chief Legal Officer of Foundation Risk Partners. You know, FRP is, is proud to be an Ormond Beach-based uh, company. We have uh, 120 employees right down the road, uh, and we have been proud to be an Ormond Beach success story. We've risen to be the 20th largest insurance agency in the United States in only seven years. But what, the reason I'm here is because when I heard that the city, through staff, may find that compliance with Florida Statute 287-138 was no big deal, or not complying was immaterial. It caused me a great deal of concern. Florida's Foreign Countries of Concern Act, or Anti-Corruption Act, as you may have heard, mandates that a governmental entity may not accept a bid on, <clears throat> pardon me, or a proposal from, or reply to, or enter into a contract which would grant the entity access to an individual's personal identifying information unless the entity provides that the governmental entity with an affidavit signed by an officer or representative of the entity under penalty of perjury, attesting that the entity does not meet any of the criteria in paragraphs uh, 2A through C. I can say with some degree of certainty that the legislature deemed that material. It, it, it's alarming that we would try to write that out of the provisions. This is not an acknowledgement of loss runs. This is an affidavit under penalty of perjury. And the law says, if you read it, that you cannot accept a bid or a proposal unless the entity provides the affidavit. So you need to ask yourself tonight, did the city accept a bid where the bidder had not provided the affidavit? Did the city accept a proposal where the bidder had not provided the affidavit? If the legislature intended to solely bar you from entering into a contract with such an entity, they would not have added the language prohibiting the acceptance of a bid or proposal. The proposal by Brown and Brown in question is by statute, non-responsive, and should be thrown out. Following me 
and allow me to make some introductions. Following me will be Joe Thacker from Nelson Mullins, who's outside counsel for us. She's been practicing in this area for over 30 years, was the Osceola County attorney for 13 years, and she could give the rest of her resume. David Lodwick, uh, mayor of Royal Palm Beach for 11 years, chairman of the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust for five years. He can give you the rest of his resume. And Alan Flores. Alan served as deputy director of legislative affairs for Governor Bush and also served as a special assistant for two years. In 2005, Alan started a career in insurance where he oversaw the Daytona Beach office for Brown & Brown and oversaw its public entity division and presided over a period in which the public entity revenue for that division doubled in size. In 2017, Alan Flores helped with the formation of FRP and its sales apparatus. He is currently the chief sales officer of the company. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Joe Thacker. Good evening, Joe Thacker, 390 North Orange Avenue, Orlando. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I would like to actually focus my um, address on the resolution before you. There is a whereas clause that states that a second alternative is neither authorized by nor consistent with the RFP and further that your code of ordinances prohibits the consideration of evaluation of factors that are uh, or criteria that are outside the scope of the RFP. Your RFP language that guides this process actually provides in the general information they want the same coverage as you have existing. But in the very next paragraph of that, under extent of coverage and options, it states that the city is requesting proposals that the, uh, for several types of policies, and the only thing they really need are the policies and the premiums that go with it, that then the city would decide on the coverages. Um, and so the resolution that says that it's not authorized or outside the scope is actually incorrect. Further, the resolution references the code of ordinances that prohibits the evaluation of factors that are outside the scope. So for those same reasons, they should be. But it also says that it should consider the cost and the completeness that was referred to before. Both are 50% of the consideration. So I have no idea why your resolution further goes on to say that it can't evaluate the secondary alternative proposal that was provided because your scope of the RFP actually calls for it. So I feel like you're required to consider it pursuant to those two factors. I'd also like to point out that your code provides that all specifications in an RFP shall be drafted so as to promote overall economy for the purposes intended and encourage comp uh, competition in satisfying the city's needs and shall not be unduly restrictive. And that's straight from your code. On the completeness of the proposal, staff failed to state that all of the required forms were not initially completed by the other proposer, but they were allowed to present those after the fact. Um, there's nothing in your code that states if this is something staff can actually do, and it should be addressed in your code and set forth in the RFP, and it, neither are there. So as Representative Leak clearly pointed out, the legis legislature thought this was so important that in uh, part of the statute that became effective January 1, 2024 requires with a bid that that affidavit be um, submitted. Uh, it was submitted after the fact just last week. Finally, the resolution states that um, the quotes for certain items. Thank you. Thank you. David Lodwick. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, my name is David Lodwick. To com just as background, yes, 11 years as mayor, I did chair the FMIT board also spent seven years as the director of member services for the League of Cities and has negotiated reinsurance contracts on behalf of the League. I would like to focus real briefly on option two that we provided. Your staff covered our, our primary option. Option two offers you a dedicated limit of insurance just to you, not shared with other cities as part of a program. It is a $35 million limit. How did we come up with that? That exceeds a one in 1,000 year event that could hit the city. One in 1,000. The FEMA standard is one in 250. So our option two is less risky, represents four times both the FEMA and Florida condo law recommended limits, and saves you an additional $42,000 under the competing bid. 
This type of option is utilized by many cities. We'll have a handout to share with you. North Miami Beach, Winter Park, multiple cities up and down the, the state of Florida utilize this program. This is a dedicated limit. Why does it matter? I'm gonna quote Chris Krepko. He is the chief of insurance for the League of Cities, a friend, and he's getting ready for board meetings this week. First and foremost, the League offers a dedicated limit because it's the right thing to do. Cities buy property insurance from us and trust that they may be whole, made whole dollar for dollar after a major loss. Two of the three pro property insurance programs offer shared limits. Second, we would not want to offer the city a property insurance coverage we would not want ourselves. As you know, we purchase hundreds of millions of dollars of property reinsurance coverage each year so that we can offer dedicated limits to our clients. None of our reinsurance contracts have shared limit provisions. They're dedicated to the FMIT and they're for our members. It does not seem fair to charge the property coverage we offer to our members by inserting a shared limit provision. On a related point, would you buy homeowners from a carrier that tells you that your claim payment depends on how many claims other people have in the state and the possibility you might not get paid? Lastly, FMIT can do this because among the three trusts, they're in a unique financial position to be able to do so. Their net position is in excess of $130 million, where the largest competing trust has a net position, excuse me, of about $36 million. When you're four times larger and you wanna do it for the right reasons, that's what you do. I'm here tonight specifically if you have questions on this issue later, I would be more than happy to assist. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Alan Flores. Thank you, Alan Flores, 225 Landmark Circle. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, City Staff. I would like to thank Kelly McGuire. She gave me a call on two occasions, and we did discuss this matter at length. She didn't rush me. She gave me an opportunity to explain where we are. Obviously, we've agreed to disagree, and that's okay. Uh, except that she's also told me that we had an opportunity to present to you today the reason why we believe that you should consider our option. Now, to reiterate Representative Leake's uh, statement, we do believe that in the interest of bid fairness and showing a sign to the vendors, vendors, whether it's insurance or not, you have to follow rules. You don't follow the rules, then then you are disqualified. In fact, when I ran Brown and Brown's Public Entity Division, on two occasions our firm was disqualified because we did not respond to an affidavit. These things are important, especially one related to a foreign corruption act. But more importantly, and because of my expertise and my history in this business, specifically with public entities, I would say to you, this is a better option. It's a better option because the way that you have to look at it, and if you look at pages two and three of the handout that we provided to you, You'll see there that we tried to simplify it for lay people because we have made a business of complicating insurance and we're sorry for that. But the, the reality is, is that FEMA, OIR, carriers, industries, we all purchase insurance based on the, the um, risk factors. And so this is less risk, more savings. It's less risk because again, the standard that is used is, is it a one in 250 limit? Is it a one in 500 event? It is a one in uh, 1,000, one in 5,000. What I did was showed you a graph that has an equivalent. Category three, category four, category five storm. So to put it into layman's terms, that's what a one in 250, one in 500, one in 1,000 mean. If you go with our option, you are buying a one in, two, one in 1,000 probability factor. That is all your own. So when a claim occurs, and unfortunately it will, when it occurs, you don't have to share it with eight other municipalities in Volusia County and hundreds of other public entities in the state of Florida. It's yours. Theirs is less. It's one in 250. Why is it one in 250? Because you have to share it. Because it is a truly shared limit. That's not me saying that, although I am an expert on it because I presided over it for 10 years. It's it's a disclaimer in their proposal and on page three that disclaimer is written there so again thank you for your time we believe 
that we're doing the right thing by offering you this option and we are proud to present that to you as a testament to how hard we want to work on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. And Kelly, do you want us to go to you? Or Steve, you want to take a swing on your proposal? Okay. Do you have anything else? I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Commission, any questions? You guys can participate, you just can't vote, correct? Yeah. So feel free if you have, have another... if you have questions. I don't well, have any I, other. I'm questions. concerned with the, the, the points that uh, Representative Leak brought up. I just want to make sure that everything is first of all that things are in compliance. I think they are now. If we accept yeah. the affidavit of compliance that was submitted on September 9th, is that correct? Right. You were included two two additional items. That's the affidavit, um, and then the acknowledgement of I believe it was addendum one or two. I can't remember which one. Those were included in your packets. Those were not received as part of the original packet. They were received afterwards. Okay. And so now, also, confirm I, mean, that that's I didn't see that, but I just want to make sure. It's like the last page. Right. And yeah, also, it's the last two pages. Right. I don't know that it's a big deal, but the notary put her, her commission expires 9-24-2024, but on her stamp it says it expires September 28th, 2024. That may have just been a clerical error. Did you have a question? When were the bids due? Let's see, I'm going to have to look. Um, I need to go back to the original RFP. Um, June 9th. Now, in the proposal. Just to be clear, the, the deadline in the RFP was June 9th, but we extended an additional week because we took questions and then we answered the questions, so we wanted to have, we wanted to give the proposers time. And I don't think we had a quorum or there was something else, too. Where yeah. We had a vote, so I understand that. Um, on the proposal for Brown and Brown on page 36, I noticed that the storage tank policy, they had effective dates of 429, 23 to 24. Did those policies renew? Those policies will not renew until April. So they were not specifically included here. But on their proposal, the, the dates that they showed were four, uh, they have, 23 yes. to 24, so those dates were incorrect. The last order. renewal was April of 2024. Correct. Okay. But uh, I'm just saying that in the proposal, as I was looking, the dates were wrong. Okay. Um, and I think that it, it's just, it's kind of confusing with the way that municipality insurance works that I've just kind of looked up some things that the city's coverage is excess coverage so it's a lot different than us buying homeowners insurance or car insurance and you know, we're buying excess coverage so it's a, it, this is a lot different and as i read the disclaimer about the preferred government insurance trust insures 680 million dollars in total insurance values in volusia county um, in the event of an occurrence so if we had like a hurricane andrew or a, a catastrophic event there could potentially be no coverage for the city of Vermont uh, for the city of Warman just something that I was reading in the proposal and I think that's all my comments for tonight mr. mayor thank you thank you Commissioner Tom yeah, I have a couple comments um, first thing I would just want to put on the record that the residents will enjoy the benefit of this competitive process you know this is one thing that us up here have tried very hard um, to not put things just on consent agendas or at, at least look at the bidding process keep it transparent keep it fair make it competitive because at the end of the day our residents will be the ones that are the winners in that um, you know i i know that our rates have increased over the last few years um, without this process or without bidding it out and i just think it's a little curious that this year we have um, come up with a bid that's three hundred thousand dollars less than last year when all everything else is increasing in life um, I will say I, I, I had some insurance kind of questions but my brain doesn't really handle all of that but why what, what it does handle is um, bid fairness this is my takeaways following rules I'm a real big rule follower and if we don't have the proper um, 
if we didn't follow the proper rules, I think that's a problem, and I think that sets us up for um, issues down the way, down the road. Um, and then I also just question that less risk, better priced, and that not shared policies. I um, I did not realize until I just saw the handout how those policies work. So I have a lot of questions, and I don't feel like I'm smart enough to ask those questions, but I do have questions. Do you want to so for now, that's that's it right that's now. Right. I want right. to hear the rest of you all. Deputy Mayor Bradley. Well, I, I, I concur with Commissioner Tolland. Um, I do have a lot of questions, um, especially some of the points that have been brought up this evening. But I, I too, uh, am concerned with the shared, the, the shared limit, the shared payment, the shared program, rather. Um, I, I kind of, I'm uh, kind of. Kind of on the side of the, 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 the one in a thousand year storm event, but I, I would like to hear more. Commissioner Persons. And I just want to say both of these for these businesses are such well respected businesses in our area. So this is I think this is tough. I mean, I think this is a tough thing to sit up here and, and do. It's very very difficult. Um, because I know nobody wants anybody to be caught without money or being able to help pay any kind of insurance fee. So th this is, I think this is really, really hard. But I think we just have to look at the facts. I'd like to ask Randy if you have any, anything you would like to say about what you've heard tonight. Well, I think what you <clears throat> have before you is uh, the <clears throat> uh, best recommendation from the program committee that heard the presentations and is making the recommendation. Um, I uh, was not present at the presentation <clears throat> uh, as part of that um, um, committee. Um, my understanding that in the, um, as is a customary practice in uh, the solicitation of bids and uh, proposals, that historically and customarily, that uh, in order to, for the staff to make sure that it has received the best responsive bid that it believes in the best interest of the city, uh, it has the ability under the code, under the language of the code, and I don't have the sections in front of me, to um, uh, discuss um, with um, proposers of bids and proposals any irregularities or um, other matters that may need some clarification. And that is customary to allow them in certain instances to uh, provide an affidavit, for instance, in this instance. And so that's what the staff did. That is customarily what they would ordinarily do. So what you have before you is their best recommendation uh, from the program committee. Ultimately, this commission gets to make that decision. And if you agree with the staff's recommendation, then you should make a motion in a second to approve the resolution that has been presented and is in your agenda because it's based on the recommendation of the program committee. If you do not agree with that um, recommendation and you want to um, award the proposal to um, foundation risk partners then we'll need to go through this resolution and make some amendments to it so the process would be to make a motion in a second to get it on the floor for discussion purposes and then we'll um, need to discuss the reasons why you wish to award uh, the proposal to foundation risk partners and not brown and brown and then we can kind of clean that that resolution up for you by way of an amendment which would require a motion to amend followed by uh, a second you would vote on the amendment and then you would vote on the, or the underlying um, resolution which is typically how we do it here so we've got a, a little bit to get through first before we get to that point and i don't know that we're done with all of the discussions here i, I think the brown and brown folks are here as well so they may want to address some of the questions um, that have been asked by the commission as well. So I don't know if that answers your question specifically. Yes, it helps. It helps. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good deal. And so we can either hear from Brown and Brown now. Steve, I guess that's you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Steve Farmer, Brown & Brown, Executive Vice President. 
105 Riverside Drive as well, longtime resident here in the city of Warren Beach. We've, we do this all the time. I have served at the pleasure of this commission for almost 20 years uh, and have worked very closely with your insurance committee over that time. I would tell you this, uh, I've worked with a lot of public entities. I had the great opportunity of working with Alan for a long time. Uh, this is the most, uh, the best insurance committee I've ever worked with, the most conscientious insurance committee I've ever worked with. And I can tell you that in working with them through the years, meeting with them as many times as I have, they really understand insurance. Now, as far as Pidget goes, Pidget has been a partner with the city of Ormond Beach for almost 15 years. Uh, they do have a shared limit program. They are very transparent about that. Uh, they buy a limit of insurance for their group that is equal to what the wind modeling says in the 250 year storm, they're absolutely right. I would tell you that the, the greatest test of insurance program is has it performed. And it has performed not only for the city of Ormond, but for all its members for a long period of time. And I can tell you, and as we all know, it has been tested. <laughs> there have been a lot of storms that have come through Florida. And not only has Pidget performed from the limit that they buy for their members, but they've also performed from their claims handling. And that's one thing that, that when we talk about these kind of processes, and I appreciate the process, I welcome the process. Commissioner Tallon, you're absolutely right. There's nothing that gets insurance carriers moving more quickly than competition. Absolutely, and, and we've talked about that with the insurance committee. On the topic of loss limits versus full limits, loss limits are, are can't, they have their place. Generally, buying a lower wind limit than you have a top total insured value is done out of necessity because you can't buy up to your total insured value, which you're able to do with both Pidget and the FMIT program. We have discussed loss limits with this insurance committee every year for the last 10 years as the property market has, has gone up. And you're absolutely right, your rates have gone up over the years and we have tried our best to manage it. We have, we have delivered quotes on loss limit programs. We have al al delivered alternative risk programs uh, and Pidget has always been the best for the city of Ormond Beach, not only from a pricing standpoint, but from a claims handling standpoint and I would also add that the risk manager for the city of Ormond Beach, uh, who has since retired, I uh, hope Christina is enjoying her retirement, but was a, on the member advisory committee for Pidget for a very long time. She was a part of the decisions that were made on behalf of the trust throughout the years. And we've offered that to the city of Ormond Beach. I'm, I'm not sure who's gonna catch the insurance hot potato, but uh, whoever does is gonna get the opportunity to sit on that board as well. So we responded to an RFP. We responded to the letter of that RFP and we delivered a program that is well known to the city of, of Ormond Beach, uh, provides incredible coverage to the city of Ormond Beach, and yes, uh, about $300,000 of savings to the city of Ormond Beach. And we're very proud of that. And I would tell you that it's not, the competition is part of it, Commissioner Tolland, but the market, believe it or not, is improving, especially in large commercial property. And I'm not gonna, pat myself on the back, but I've been in this business for 30 years. I have some pretty strong relationships. And believe me, as a resident of City of Ormond Beach, and as someone who grew up here, I call in all the favors I can on behalf of the city. So we're proud of our response. We're proud of what we've delivered. Your insurance committee has recommended it, and we hope that this commission will accept that. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Stephen, any questions for Stephen? Not at this time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Just to piggyback on what Commissioner Tolland said, I'd like to go back with some historical data. On 2015, our insurance for the city of Warren Beach was $691,878. Last year, we incurred a 43% increase, which bumped our insurance up to $1.2 million. Then we sent it out for bid and the residents of Warren Beach are gonna see a $300,000 decrease. So the process works, like you said, Commissioner Tolland, on, on competition and, and bidding these big projects or big line items, if you will, um, out. So I just, those were the historic data that I had from uh, the finance director, I just wanted to share that. And I promise that's my last comment for tonight. Kelly, I'm gonna ask a couple questions if you can help me out. Um, 
what did the program committee even address the issue as far as the affidavit of compliance? The program committee did not. The purchasing department did. <clears throat> okay. And as Randy said, they followed their typical procedure. All right. And uh, tell me this on the shared limit versus name storm limit, what was the program committee's thoughts on that? The program committee discussed that, um, and it really there were a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, we have, as, as Steve said, we have talked about that for the last 10 years. So that wasn't something that we were particularly interested in considering. That's number one. Number two, it's not consistent with our current insurance program. And that is part of the issue here, is that a $35 million sublimit is not consistent with our particular program that we have. And the RFP called for proposals that were equal to or comparable to, right? So that's our scope of service we're working with. And that's why we really didn't consider that. We considered the primary proposal, the $1.652 million proposal. I'll say it that way so we're clear on which one I'm talking about. And we didn't go into a lot of conversation about the other one because from our standpoint, it didn't meet the scope of service. I will also say, and this is true of all of our proposals when we do an RFP, we don't allow a proposer to give us 10 different options, right? They, we don't allow that unless we specifically ask for it in the proposal. They give us one option, every proposal, proposer gives us one option, and we evaluate those. So the, the concern we have here, I, I suppose is the best way to frame it, is that we didn't ask for our sublimits. We didn't ask for other options, right? There are insurance companies out there or agents of record out there that may have provided us proposals beyond Brown and Brown and, and uh, financial risks. So that is the concern that I will um, talk about with respect to being in charge of purchasing, right? We tried to define that scope of service so that we are comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges because then the evaluation becomes extremely subjective. All right, and it, I mean, it's fair to say we want the absolute best coverage for our residents for the lowest possible cost. Okay. Okay. And both okay. of these firms are equally highly qualified to deliver that, correct? They're okay. very qualified and the underlying insurance trusts, you know, we have no concerns about them paying out claims. Right. I just, I'm looking at, uh, Fort Myers, Winter Park, Northport, North Miami Beach, not slouches of cities that have gone with uh, the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust, highly respected. Um, and so I'm not sure I understand why the committee wouldn't accept differing proposals. I mean, where are we going to get caught in a problem? going with similar insurance programs to these other cities that have not had a problem with them. I mean, Fort Myers was just hit with Ian a year and a half ago. I don't think they had any issues with FMIT from everything I've heard. Um, I was just down there on a coastal resiliency seminar listening to how they recovered and didn't hear any, any problems with, with their insurance. but. I guess that's what I'm trying to get to is the the absolute best coverage for the lowest possible price. And you're saying the $35 million per limit somehow doesn't provide that? No, what I'm, I'm not saying that. The 30, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the scope of service was not written to include that, right? It, it wasn't. It was written for our insured value of $163 million, roughly, with no sublimit. Okay. That doesn't mean a sublimit isn't something we should consider, right? But the problem we have is the scope of service was written a certain way. So now it becomes difficult now to try to bring that back in. Because Brown and Brown certainly could have provided us a proposal for a sublimit. Whether the amount would have been more or less, I can't tell you, because we don't have that information. And there may have been others that would have provided as well. So it's more of a procurement issue than it is uh, an issue of whether, you know, 35 million is not an appropriate limit for us. Okay. In either case, we have, of course, in addition to insurance, we have FEMA coverage as well. So. 
commission any other questions or concerns commissioner Persons? Yeah, I, I think one of my main concerns is just the the storm event because you know we never know what's going to happen and we want our residents uh, to, to be safe and we want to be able to pay for anything that would happen so I'm that is one of my concerns there is that that the brown and brown doesn't offer the one in 1000 versus the one in 250 I, mean, I think that's something that we need to think about Commissioner, I was gonna say so your your apples to apples and then the extras the extra things um, because we've done it a certain way in the past doesn't mean we shouldn't open our mind to look at all the different things out there like cybersecurity is big now I know that that's been addressed but the world is changing and our needs are changing so I'm just wondering if there is a way that you can just look or maybe you did looked at the apples and then the extras and then who can provide the residents with that best product um, I'm not sure we're comparing apples to apples well and that, that's what I'm afraid of as well and maybe it's the process that's flawed and not the the actual products that were presented right. so you can help me Mr. Mayor, if I may, sure. Um, we do bring the RFP to you before we let that out to bid. So we brought the RFP to you with the indication that we were going to pursue the same coverage that we had last year. Now I don't have a crystal ball, and neither one of nobody here does. Um, I agree with Commissioner Tallin that the city benefited greatly through the competition of this process. But if you are wishing to seek a higher limit and get a lower rate. That is the direction you give to Mr. Hayes, and he can give you some information on that. But I just wanted to be clear that it wasn't that we didn't think of it. It's just that, and it's not the way that we always do things, that was the process that we were going to follow. Okay. And that's what we did. It wasn't, like, mindless. So. Commission? <laughs> I, again, I just don't think, you know, when you're looking at one in 250 and one in 1,000, you're not apples and apples. Yeah, um, I don't think it's apples to apples either. I mean, I prefer more insurance, you know, that, that we can. I mean, well, I mean, you have two highly qualified companies. Right. Uh, some little abnormalities maybe in each of the uh, processes of how it how it got here uh, but the lowest cost does appear to be FRP unless I'm if I'm missing something foundation risk has the lowest cost One, one million four hundred eighty-one thousand seven hundred eighty-nine is is FRPs with the thirty-five million dollar limit, and then brown and brown is one five twenty-two nine thirty um, as bid forty-one thousand and change. You're looking at the total at the total premium at the bottom. Correct. Randy, may I ask you a question, or Mr. Mayor? Sure. So, how concerned are you about us not following the rules with the affidavit being included in the packet? Well, I think it's a matter of interpretation. <clears throat> so, um, under the statute, they do have to provide an affidavit, uh, and the affidavit was provided. It was provided after the fact, and this is something that I think is allowed by the code. It's something that historically and customarily is done um, or allowed by. Um, the um, evaluation committees on lots of different bids and proposals. Now, you're free to make a different determination and treat it differently. So I think what the staff and the program committee did is they gave you what they believe to be their best recommendation. Um, you ultimately make the final decision and you can agree with that recommendation or you can disagree with it. If you disagree with it, you need um, to help us understand the basis for that because we'll need to work that into the resolution that you will need to approve 
um, accepting this proposal and awarding the contract, essentially. The reason for that is any expenditure over $25,000 must be approved by written resolution. So we're going to have to fix this on the fly this evening if that's the way that you're leaning. Um, I think that um, the, again, the, the resolution was prepared based on the staff recommendation and their um, 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 evaluation analysis of the proposals were based on the current lines of coverage. And ordinarily when a bid or proposal is issued, uh, it will expressly state whether alternative options are allowed or not. And it was not, um, it was not, it didn't expressly state that in those terms in this proposal. What it did say was we're soliciting proposals based on the existing lines of coverage and coverage amounts. So from the staff perspective, they were trying to do an apples to apples comparison because that makes it easy for the commission. Had the staff, <clears throat> um, um, if they had desired to solicit additional proposals, the RP would have expressly stated that. Now, what you got was a proposal from Brown and Brown. There's a question about whether the affidavit was timely submitted and whether or not that should uh, operate as a, um, as a um, um, rejection of their bid for being non-responsive, uh, if you will. And if that's the case, then the question is, which of the two proposals from uh, Foundation Risk Partners um, should you accept? Um, I think based on the staff recommendation, it would be the option one, which, which omits certain lines of coverage because they were not soliciting proposals for other variations. Now, you can agree or disagree with that interpretation as well, but that's the staff's best recommendation to this commission. Ultimately, you will make that determination, and then we'll do our best to put this resolution together for you. Does that help? I think it does. Um, well, the lowest, the lowest is foundation risk. Right. And if yeah. I can ask a question of uh, Mayor Ludwig, and then I'll, Steve, I'll allow you to respond as well. Uh, you started to cover it. I don't know if you had enough time in your three minutes, but the shared limit versus the named storm limit, can you tell me uh, your opinion of which is best? Um, if there's one that's best? Mr. Mayor, members of council, again, thank you. You tell me what happens, I'll tell you what's best. I think that's fair in insurance, Steve. In the event, and, and another reason why shared limit is a very, very relevant discussion for the city of Ormond Beach. As I sat with reinsurance companies and underwriters in London and we discussed modeling, one of their first discussions is where do you have high concentrations in value? For most programs, probably agree, it's Tri-County, Palm Beach, Broward, Dade, that's where a lot of the values tend to be driven in the state. For whatever reason, maybe because the headquarters are here, there's a high concentration within Volusia County and Brevard County within the PGIT program. Shared limit only becomes a problem when you get near or exceed the cap that is purchased. So if it's 240 million, I believe that was the number in the proposal. I'm not gonna try to quote that hardcore. I'll let Steve answer to that. But as that number gets approached, reinsurance companies stop paying because they've got to wait and collect all the claims because anything that gets up to that 240, that's when they stop paying, okay? The 35 million, when you look at that as a percentage of your total values, the one in 250 tends to run around eight to 10% of a city's values. That's a direct hit from a category, typically a two, maybe a two and a half to three. I went through a two at Royal Palms, so I, I have a little painful experience from that. The dedicated limit is set aside to you, the funds are set aside to you, they buy reinsurance specific to it and dedicate their own surplus. We know that's the number. It, it speeds up payment. The other factor in the two programs, because of the way the league is written with keeping risk able to write the dedicated limit, your property insurance adjuster is a league of staff employee. Under shared limit programs, PGIT will have claims liaisons to assist you, and they have adjusters that represent the reinsurance companies. Different approach, both work, 
I would rather appeal to the League of Cities board on a claims issue than go to mediation with a reinsurance company. But shared limit works until numbers get big, then they become challenged, and as it states in the policy, when that limit is hit of insurance reach, the insurance company, PGIT's responsibility would end. The FMIT's would end at the, if you choose option two, at 35 million because that's the limit that's being provided or purchased, specifically to you. I hope I didn't go astray. Thank you. Stephen, did you want to respond? Not to argue with staff, your proposal does ask for alternatives. As pointed out by Ms. Thacker in her presentation, right after the paragraph that said apples to apples said alternatives. We provided an alternative. This is fun. <laughs> right? Insurance 101. Yeah, well, this is much deeper than 101. <laughs> 102. 501. Yeah, and, and, and generally we don't want to do this right here, right? That's why we have insurance committees, and that's why we spend time in meetings, and that's why we go through processes, and some very smart people sat in a room and made a recommendation. But what I will say with this, we are a shared limit program. We are transparent. I do not represent the League of Cities. I have competed with them for many years, uh, 20 years to be exact. I know them to be a fine program. Uh, there are some very smart people within the Pidget Trust that run the Pidget Trust that use data analytics and wind modeling to determine the limits they buy for their members. And these sound bites are great in these kind of processes. What I always try to do as the insurance nerd that I am is get my insurance to, to look at what has happened in the past and then project that into the future. The Pidget program has always bought a, a sufficient limit for their members. And they look at it every year. They look at their spread of risk and they pay very close attention to their spread of risk. And we have not even come close to exceeding the limit that they've purchased for their members for the last 20 years. What I would say to you about FMIT is that we have been handling the city of Ormond Beach now for 20 years and I, I'm not going to say how many times they've quoted but it's been very few and it hasn't been recently and Commissioner Tallon this is indicative of, of how the market has improved we are now seeing FMIT show up in coastal cities where they haven't typically been in our area at least which is what I will speak to so you're, you're looking at apples to apples. They're both great programs with great, great coverage. I would ask more questions about uh, dedicated limits because I don't quite understand that, but I don't represent them. I don't, rep I don't understand how they can buy a limit. They have surplus, Pidget has surplus. I'm not sure what happens after the surplus. But I know Pidget has performed incredibly well, not only for the city of Warren Beach, but for its members. And that's where I'm gonna hang my hat with that particular carrier. And does Bridget, tell what limits they buy, or do you consider that proprietary? 330 million of wind limit for the members. Because that's for, a shared for eight or it is shared. Yes, they're very transparent about that. And honestly, that's the way you get the pricing and and the terms right. and conditions that you get. No different than a large commercial business with billions of dollars of total insured value buying 100 million or 250 million of coverage because they can't buy two billion dollars of property coverage here in Florida. So they buy a what we call a loss limit. That's the alternate program that you're looking at with the 35 million. That's buying less wind coverage based on your specific risk and what we think your risk is in a particular storm year. Pick the number. But that is something, as I said before, that most insurers are kind of forced into. You don't have to buy that. Unless it's really significant savings, why would you do that and take the risk? Commissioner Tom. So yes, I do have a question sure. for you, Steve, and for the for the mayor. Um, since we're talking about shared and dedicated, mm -hmm. how does that affect the level of service when an event does occur in in the county? And you have all these cities that how does does that affect being a shared? Um, group? No, not that does that I'm affect aware the level of, of service? We're I mean, talking about money, but that's also very yeah. important. Like we want to be the preferred. 
Well, I would argue that you are for me anyway. Uh, I've been on the ground the minute a claim is hit in City of Mormon, so and I'm I'm right there, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but no, I mean, each each company has their own way of handling claims, and again, that's something that I would say is I would ask whoever's been handling the insurance if Christina were here, she could talk about the level of claims handling that Pidget and their TPAs have, have given to the City of Mormon Beach. Uh, I can tell you, I, I worry about that very much when a claim hits. I'm, my boots are always on the ground. But we have made sure that Pidget's boots have been on the ground for you. Uh, as far as shared versus uh, dedicated limit, I don't have an answer for that question. When a claim happens, I'm going to have adjusters out here, and we're going to be working hard. So I don't know if my colleague has I, No, I, I tend to agree. The shared versus dedicated doesn't matter. The way it, it did matter, and I, I'll speak to this mostly because I – I signed the first contract with the recovery company at the league at my last board meeting while I was chairing. So Synergy Recovery is actually integrated with the league's adjusters. They work on the same underwriting and claims platform. So the adjusters are on the ground in real time. And when you talk about right after a storm, one of the things we learned, I was on the board in, in 04 and 05 when we all got hit. My city got hit three times. By the way, the standing joke is since I left, they haven't been hit, so I don't know what that says. Um, but part of the biggest process, we, and the hole in the process, is after a storm, your staff are all wearing five, six, seven hats. They've got to roll up numbers to the county within 48, 72 hours. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. The hole in the donut seemed to be who's going to inspect our own properties? How do we get those done? So rather than tell you what the league does, City of Fort Myers, after being hit and hit badly, with one of their department heads working with Synergy staff boots on the ground within the first 24 hours, had surveyed every single city property within 48 hours. Done. Damage assessments, real-time photos, adjusters being assigned where they were needed at higher damage sites. because. You can also agree, one of our biggest challenges is that you get an adjuster to show up and he wants to go to the building with minimal damage and we've got to walk him over to the one that needs all the work. Um, that's where Synergy's integration with the program. It's a third party vendor, but it's a vendor who's taking the initial report, working in real time, so when they take the photo and upload it, the adjuster's actually at his desk able to look at it and say go. In addition, the program includes $500,000 of mitigation coverage. We know that the claim will be less if there's enough money to fund immediate recovery. You've got to get stabilized. You've got to get tarps on buildings. You've got to get things ripped out that are wet and get dry. This is outside of deductible. That is upfront money. And the league does it different. The dedicated is more about risk. The league takes risk on the front end. That makes them adjust it. But it means we got skin in the game with the reinsurance company. The shared limit tends to work with the adjusters and get the claims paid. It's just a different approach. Both work. I like boots on the ground, but both work. I've worked with standard carriers for 35 years. It works. Probably off protocol, but if I could ask Randy, I would, I would say, how has Pidget handled claims for the city of Ormond Beach over the past many years? Um, <clears throat> on that specific question, we, we have had no problems with the service uh, from Pidget or from Brown and Brown. And um, Steve and I have had some pretty deep philosophical discussions on the need for excess liability coverage, right? So you know where I yes, stand sir. on that. Yep. Um, but the, the service that we have had has been very good. And um, like I said, I, I wasn't at the at the presentation at the, at the meeting for the presentations, but understand that um, you know both uh, both entities are well respected and well qualified, uh, and I, I would expect that service by either one of them would be would be superb. But in answer to Steve's question, we've had excellent service. So thank you. Good sure, question sir. for Steve. You made a comment that. Um, the league hasn't provided or hasn't been competitive in the past, but when's the last time that the city of Mormon put this out for bid? It's been 20 years, hasn't it? No, 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 no. What's I'll let bid, purchasing bid answer that question, but we've been through many of these bid processes in the time that I've been here. So four years, maybe? Six years, somewhere in there.
Yeah, you have to remember, I've been here a long time, so uh, we've been through many of these processes. And do we ever get more than just two bids to, I mean, have we been very competitive? I mean, this has always been our struggle. We don't get a lot of, you know, um, action when we put bids out. So I'm just asking Kelly, have we, no, Please. in the past, gotten many <laughs> bids? Okay. So that we're clear, when we've put out bids in the past, they have been bids, they've been RFPs, and they've been RFPs generally, I can't say in every case, but generally they've been RFPs for agent of record, right? So you and stay with the company, no, but you just we're, picking an agent? We're, we're asking for RFPs for agent of record. Okay. And I would say in the time that I've been here, I don't recall getting any proposals from from at least for the last 15 years okay. from any other agents of record other than Brown and Brown. Commissioner Sarge. So I have a question on that though, because if one agent represents a certain carrier and another agent represents a certain carrier, how are we getting the best if this agent can't go to this carrier? This, I mean, that doesn't really um, benefit the residents of Mormon by doing it that way. I don't see it uh, because you're not creating competition. Just my, you know, I see that. It was a different process. Before, it was a different process. In fairness, too. Um, and, you know, just in full disclosure, I've been on, I'm not now currently, but been on the league of the Florida League of Cities in a, for eight years um, up until August, and then was on the executive committee of the board for four years, the last four years. We would get reports on the uh, insurance trust and I was always blown away by how well they performed and particularly for cities. I think there's even a rebate that comes back to cities uh, on the premiums, a portion to the Volusia League of Cities. Um, and so I'm confident either or can handle uh, whatever the claims are and that the one that works with cities the most knows uh, how to work with cities best and I think that's what the mayor was was alluding to but um, so I'm honestly I'm comfortable with either either proposal I I feel like <clears throat> maybe going with the less expensive proposal might be better uh, it is only for a year so you know this will be coming back to you in short order um, Mr. Bay if I'm reading this correctly um, FRP is the lower of the two yes. by about 41,000. 40, yeah, about 40,000. That's, that's how I read it. Yeah. Is that correct, Kelly? Did you get a copy of the information? No, I didn't, so I'm not sure. That we were provided? I'm looking at, I think that's the it's last about page. about 40, 41,000. Down at the bottom. Yeah, this is, this is just for a year. What? And I, you know, I want to spend taxpayers' dollars wisely. So I'm inclined to go with the lower lower proposal. That is the 2024 $35 million limit. Correct. Correct. You got the copy as well, Joyce. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If, the, if I may, Mayor. Sure. If, if the commission is going to go the, in that direction, we need to get clarified. I, I haven't had a chance to look at this particular one, but I'm assuming it's the same as their original proposal, that this doesn't include probably flood coverage, and it doesn't include the other four coverages um, that were part of the memo. So if you are gonna go in this direction, we wanna make sure that those get included in the resolution, because staff cannot purchase those coverages without your approval. It's listed. It is listed, thank it is you. It is listed, okay. Mr. Mayor, I'll make that motion. Second. Move, so moved and seconded. Any other questions, comments, um, I, or discussion? I think Commissioner Mr. Persons. Flores wanted to say something. Did you want to say something? No, you just clarify. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And being mindful, this is for one year, and, and, and again, right. both companies are, are very well qualified. But I, you know, this one's just, I say it's, it's, it's a little bit cheaper, and you know, I think it's worth trying. So your motion is an amendment, if I understand it correctly, well, Deputy Mayor. And Randy's going to help yeah, you. Yes, sir. Motion second of the resolution for discussion purposes. And once you get that on the board, then we can make a motion to amend that. So moved. Second. Okay. okay so now we, uh, um, 
motion to amend. Motion to amend, and it would be helpful to read and just amend your It sounded to me that it was that after it was submitted, we were they were compliant. They were compliant after it was received, yes. And staff received it as a customary would um, um, as part of the, the, the process. I think the question that Foundation Risk Partners has made is that uh, it was uh, untimely and therefore non responsive, and therefore the Brown and Brown proposal should be rejected. It does, and Alan, did you want to include anything? I would include that in there, I think, because it was late. Staff may do business that way. I wouldn't recommend doing business that way, and uh, so I would find that it was not in compliance at the time that they were supposed to be supposed to be submitted as one of the findings. Um, and then also the one, two, three, fourth, whereas uh, contract shall be made to the responsible offerer whose proposal is determined in writing to be the most advantageous to the city, taking into consideration price and evaluation factors set forth in the request for proposal. Um, I think the commission has the option and ability to disagree with staff's analysis of that, um, <coughs> noting that staff determined both companies to be uh, excellent and able to provide high quality service. Uh, it would be really just a disagreement between the shared limit versus name storm limit. Um, that'd be one, one of the findings. <coughs> And then, you know, looking at the Florida League of Cities' ability to uh, provide for their own, if you will, um, it's really incredible the way that, that the Florida League of Cities set up the Municipal Insurance Trust in a way that, that benefits all of Florida cities, um, and particularly in the, for the purchase of an insurance products um, there's really I don't think there's anything like it in the nation it's led to the Florida League of Cities being the premier league in the entire nation uh, they do things <clears> that would blow your mind if you sat on that board and listened to the presentations of the things that they do to benefit Florida cities uh, including the insurance but but other things beyond that and uh, so you know I, I don't know that staffs well aware of that. I had a unique perspective on that for, for several years, but what else do you need? What else do you need? Right now? Um, if that. you can maybe take a five minute bathroom break uh, on recess. Yeah, we, we can kind of get, we can get it cleaned up and then um, I can suggest some changes to you as part of the amendment. And then, um, um, and then you can, you can make a motion and second the amendment and then we can Finalize this. All right, we're in recess for 10 minutes. Session and uh, the city attorney has brought a revised resolution to us. And Randy, I'll, I'll let you go through that. 
Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I uh, apologize it took a little longer than expected. Um, so what we ended up doing is just revising the resolution. So what you have before you is the revised resolution that incorporates um, um, the um, findings that the commission discussed before the break. I'll go through kind of paraphrase uh, for you, if you will. Um, so we changed the caption so that it reads that. There you go. Uh, it's resolution accepting a proposal from Foundation Risk Partners Public Entity Services for the provision of property liability and workers' compensation insurance for various lines of insurance coverage, so on and so forth. Um, the uh, whereas recitals on the first page, I believe, are unchanged. They were general findings. On the second page, um, we did make some modifications consistent with the direction of the commission. Um, no change to the first whereas recital on page two um, or the second or the third. The fourth whereas incorporates um, no, no change to the fourth one as well. Um, the fifth whereas is the finding by the commission finding the proposal, proposal submitted by Brown and Brown to be non-responsive because the affidavit required by section 287.1384 statutes was not timely provided. And therefore, the pro pro proposal submitted by Brown and Brown is determined to be non-responsive, is hereby rejected. Um, the next whereas finds that the commission finds proposal submitted by Foundation Risk Partners as depicted on the premium summary attached in the column headed 2024-35 MM limit to be the best response to proposal to the RFP and at the best cost for the city. So we took the um, the one page um, uh, from the um, from from the material that was provided at the dais, and it's that column in the far right is is what we're incorporating. Um, no change to the last whereas recital on that page. Over on the page three, um, no change to section one. Section two includes a change. It now reads, the city commission finds and accepts a proposal of foundation risk partners as depicted on a premium summary attached here to in a column headed 2024 35 mm limit to be the best response to proposal to the RP and at the best cost for the city and authorizes the execution of all documents necessary to effectuate said insurance coverage coverages for a one-year period beginning on October 1, 2024, and ending on September 30th, 2025. Uh, there's no change to Section 3 or Section 4, uh, and that is, um, in summary and substance, the revised resolution has been prepared for the Commission at your direction. So procedurally, I think um, the way we can handle this is there's a motion and a second on the floor for the resolution as presented by um, the staff. So if the maker of that motion and the seconder of that motion want to withdraw the motion in a second, that'll take us back to square one and we can start all over again. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. Second. So now we need a motion in a second to approve uh, the, Susan, do we need a, a different number for this or just uh, probably so, right? A different resolution number? Yes. Whatever you suggest. I, I, I think I think we probably should. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have a number handy? 161. 161. That's so um, we need a motion a second to approve resolution 2024-161. So moved. Uh, second. And, you, and then, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you and you can run the meeting. Thank you, Randy. And uh, Commissioner Sargent. I know that there was a handful of policies that were being taken over, assumed by the new agent. Is there anything that needs to be done from the dais for those policies? No, those were included in the in the resolution. So I'll coordinate that with them. Okay, I just want to make sure that there wasn't anything that because we're on a time crunch with 10-1 coming. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'll just say um, honestly how uncomfortable this whole process was. You're working with people who have been uh, customers of the city 
for years, people who have been uh, colleagues and co-workers and have worked for competing industries. And before I came tonight, I had no idea how I was going to vote. And I was, you have a certain amount of dread when you don't know. Um, I landed where I landed based on all the information presented tonight. Um, and I will say that I believe competition is good. I've always believed that. So I hope that this is a, a healthy process going forward uh, for continued competition because I think our residents will benefit from that. And I would just note that both companies are highly qualified, highly successful companies, and I uh, don't want to lose that in the, in the scheme of things. Deputy Mayor Brown. If I may, I would just say I, I, I was I was pleased and more comfortable with the defined limit instead of the share. Thank you. Anyone else? No, I just want to say I was I was very uncomfortable too because I've known people on both sides for for years and. I kind of had a sick feeling in my stomach, really, almost the whole night. So um, I just, I just want to put that out there that I think both, both agencies are highly respected, and um, I just want to leave it at that. Thank you. Very good, and I believe that Deputy Mayor Briley, Commissioner Persis, and myself are the only three voting on this item. If there's no other questions or comments, please call the vote. All right, I will call all of the members and then you pick those not voting. Just say abstain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Sargent? Abstain. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Abstain. And Mayor Partington? Yes. Thank you all very much for being here. And we will now go to reports, suggestions, and requests, starting tonight with City Manager Joyce Shanahan. Um, we've been here a long time, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to answer any questions. I do want to remind you that your your October, the first meeting in October has been moved to Wednesday due to National Night Out on Tuesday. So your next meeting is 10-2-2024. And if the commission has any questions of staff, we're happy to answer those. If any questions? Uh, commission for the city manager? No. Thank you. Uh, Assistant City Manager Claire Whitley. Thank you, Claire. Uh, City Attorney Randy Hayes. Nothing for me. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Randy. And tonight we start with Commissioner Sargent. All right, I'll be brief. It's already <laughs> almost 11 o'clock. This is the longest meeting we've had. 9/11, um, uh, the the event that the firefighters put on, which they put on themselves. It's not city staff doesn't help them. Um, they do it. Uh, the walk up and down. Marina Grand, I thought it was only once when I showed up, and come to find out they do it four and a half times. Uh, Commissioner Persis and I did it once, up yes. and down. We didn't take the elevator down. Um, uh, it was great. Uh, Crime Stoppers event was another uh, great event that we had this past week with Officer Marianne Mealy, if I'm correct. Um, Mele, thank you. Uh, great event to see all the officers that are nominated for this great award just to hear everything that they do. The officer that uh, won the award for Officer of the Year, I mean, he was responding to a gentleman that was getting ready to hang himself, and this officer pulled his vehicle underneath the guy and then cut him down. I mean, it was just, just to hear him tell this story is heartbreaking and, and glad that he, you know, he was able to do it. Um, and I'll end with this Saturday, beach cleanup, it's a national beach cleanup. Uh, I will be there with my boys Saturday, the 21st, Andy Ramada Park, 8 to 11, if anyone wants to attend. And with that, I'll say good night. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Persis. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for mentioning that beach cleanup. I've done that beach cleanup, uh, Commissioner Sargent. I'm going to be out of town. Well, I'm going to be out of town, so I'm not going to be able to make it, but I would normally be there. So, but I also wanted to say I'm disappointed to say I'm not going to be able to attend the ribbon cutting for the newly renovated uh, baseball field at Nova Community Complex. I'm going to, as I said, be out of town, but I know that's really important. We've been waiting a long time to get that field back, so it's very, very exciting. And I just want to thank um, uh, Joyce Shanahan. I want to thank Sean Finley for today. We met with some neighbors uh, on Hidden Hills and 
looks like we may be coming close to a resolution for our pond down there. And I just want to thank you all so much for taking time with these people. They're great people. And, um, and you just made them so happy. So I just, I just really appreciate that very, very much. And uh, yes, uh, Com uh, Commissioner Sargent and I did go up one flight and down one flight. And when I got d down to the bottom, my legs were shaking. And I really thought I was in good shape. But I tell you what, that is, uh, that is a tough thing to do. And those firemen, they, they, are, they had all their equipment on. I mean, and not, you know, I had no equipment on. So, uh, but it was, it really made you think about what those men went through that day and that didn't come, that didn't come home. It was um, very touching, but I just can't, it was just a great experience. So I just, I think they, they did a great job putting that on. And then we just swore in two new police officers in the city of Ormond Beach. And I don't remember their names right now, but we're very happy that they're with us. And it was a great celebration and their families just seem so happy. So. Um, I just, uh, I think it was just a great time. I love seeing our first responders and police get, get all the attention they deserve. And thank you, everyone. Have a good night and be safe. Thank you. Commissioner, Deputy Mayor Briley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I won't uh, uh, be long. I, I, I concur with uh, Commissioner Sargent on the Crime Stoppers uh, dinner. It was a very nice, nice event. And congratulations to our officer, Officer Melee, for being uh, being nominated, um, I also attended the, with uh, Commissioner Persis and Commissioner Tolland the swearing in of our three new officers. Two were there, one was apparently absent. Um, we want to welcome them to our Orm Beach family. Um, it was kind of nice to see Sean Daly and Doug Thomas here this evening. It kind of brought back memories of the old planning board <laughs> from about 20, 25 years ago uh, when we all served together. And uh, you know, I did, uh, it, it was just it was just neat. Um, I was approached again by a resident today in regards to if there's any interest from the city commission. I'll just throw this out there. I've already sent a letter. Uh, if there's any uh, interest in sending a letter on to the state as a commission regarding the paving of the uh, Tomoka State Park roadway. So I'm not interested only because it's been I, it's, it's state property. There's not yeah. there's really not much we can do about it. So well, and it's 12 years too late. I mean, they started this process 12 years ago, and nobody could have found out and maybe brought the, the objection to the appropriate governing entity at that time. That's, that's one of the bigger problems that I have with it. I mean, the contracts have been let. I think all the design work and, and engineering has been done. And so for us, we never tell state parks what to do, even, even ones that are wholly within our city. I don't believe we've ever had any planning or other kind of authority over a state park. Well, again, it was requested by a resident, so right. I'm just passing along. Yeah, and I mean, if we did, we'd be extremely busy every time a resident requested something that 50 people wanted out of a city of 45,000 people. We'd be chasing our tails trying to get those letters out fast enough. And and to what effect? Agreed. I think this That's is the, this is one of those that just kind of hits home with people. So. Understood. Understood. Thank you, Mr. President. It's up to you. I am not in favor of that. It's not our jurisdiction. I just don't think that staff needs another <laughs> task on hand to write another letter. I just I don't see the validity in it. I think the residents need to go to who can make that decision. It's already been made at the state level. And I just don't think we need to send letters for every single thing possible. Thank you. And Commissioner Tallin stated her well thought out and actually re researched uh, opinion last last time. That was the other thing. I, I really don't have enough information to launch the attack without having maybe a workshop or something like that, but it's already so far down the road. That the, the only thing that could, could possibly be why we would want to do it is to ask the state to consider more of a set, more of a permeable permanent permeable Surface. product because the, the residents were complaining about flooding but I don't know if there's any validity if you put a road one and a half mile paved it's just really going to affect the the flooding so I'm okay with with letting it let the state handle it and let the the folks deal with the state if it's you know it it like you said mayor it started a long time ago it's already been appropriated it's already in the works and they did say that they were going to have that historic 
um, oversight to protect the land. So I'm okay with it. Good deal. So my comments. No, I'm good. Thank okay. you. We'll go to Commissioner Tolan. Yep. So yeah. I will not be redundant, and I know um, that I am notorious for talking a lot, but I will. I will be quick. I want to congratulate Evelyn on her meaningful career and uh, wish her well on retirement. I'm sure we all do that. And I also want to congratulate um, Mr. Leak and all the legislatures here, you know, for serving us well in our community. Um, I did attend, you all didn't mention, I'll mention the things we didn't talk about. I attended the Volusia City Elected Officials Roundtable and uh, we heard some really interesting updates from Advent Hospital and from Halifax, from the Florida Department of Health and SMA. And I just want to say that, you know, we're very blessed to have these organizations in our, in our community. They all are doing a stellar job addressing the needs of our residents. Um, there was also a discussion on how um, on and off beach parking will look. And um, that is starting October 1st. Anybody in the audience that wants to look at it, there is a Volusia Beaches app, and you can register, or you can register at parkvolusia.org. Um, there will be a Celebrate Volusia Festival at the Ocean Center on October 6th. I think that's a Sunday afternoon from 2 to 5. And I did go to a Main Street meeting this Monday, and. Um, I appreciate the fact that they're participating in our comp plan update. They're being very active in, in all the areas. Um, and just as a FYI, Riverfest is coming up November 16th and 17th. They are have, Main Street is having their annual meeting and celebration October 21st at the Orman Museum of Arts and Gardens at the rooftop. They had that last year. Um, they are going to be doing their public art groundbreaking October 30th um, at 10 a.m. at the casements, and, they, and that will be kicking off their sculpture tour November to April 1st. Um, and I have two suggestions in whether, if you guys agree, that maybe we can move this forward. So you know how a lot of residents have come forward, come forward discussing issues with code enforcement. And, you know, we, we, we've talked about it a little bit, but, but not a lot. So I'm wondering if the, a, a pretty easy way of at least letting the residents know we care and maybe adding some education to all of those that have moved into our community new is to some social media news blasts of what's allowed, what's not allowed, like boats aren't allowed in your driveway or did you know you know so it's not like a specific person we're pointing out it's kind of a generic thing if you guys think that's a great idea maybe staff can talk to Jen if you don't that's fine all right can we do no we can't do target marketing I'm good with that where's Jen she's not here Jen. Uh, hmm? um what do you think? Anybody else have any other comments on that? I want to think about it. I want to think about that okay, too, I'll bring it up again, and then you guys can say what you really think. You know, you go through different neighborhoods and you see different things. Yeah, that's true. You know. All right, and the other brainstorm idea I had is I was driving today on um, Granada, and I was thinking about your mulch, Commissioner <laughs> Sergeant, that you absolutely <laughs> hate, and all the rain and how it falls off, right? So I just did this in my yard, and it was very easy to do, and it's containing the mulch, is you use that very thin black trim that doesn't stick up. If you install it correctly, it's very indiscreet, keeps the mulch up in the medians, and it could be a good fix for now until we <laughs> take all the mulch out and put native plants everywhere. It's a plastic, I'm teasing. Oh. <laughs> anyway, it's just a it's thought. Good. And you all can decide if you think it's a good idea or not. But I'm trying to just help you out. And with all of that, I will say good night. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I'll try to get us out of here by 11. I just wanted to say, uh, as far as the budget goes, the 24-25 budget is built around the needs and priorities of our residents. We all worked hard on that. It ensures that Ormond Beach continues 
to be a safe and welcoming place for families and businesses alike. Uh, a major focus is on public safety with investments in the design of a new police department and emergency operations center and the addition of nine new police vehicles to keep our community protected. Beyond that, this budget also invests in areas that directly impact your daily life, improving our parks, upgrading our technology to better serve you, and maintaining the high quality services that make Ormond Beach such a great place to live. As a city, we're committed to using these funds responsibly to enhance the safety, services, and overall quality of life for everyone in our city. And uh, cities suffer inflation just like individuals do. So Ormond Beach is no stranger to increased costs. We've held the line and held the line and held the line on, on taxes, any kind of increases, but at some point uh, you have to make adjustments. And I would point out, even though this year is an increase above the rollback rate, the rollback rate is a, is a funky calculation, and sometimes the rollback rate can be a huge increase in taxes, but by state law, it's not defined as one in that particular situation. So, uh, you know, that, that's the one argument. The other thing I would point out, and I'm using Jim Cameron's uh, budget report chart, that Ormond Beach is uh, the lowest uh, proposed rate for 24-25 at 4.09 of all of the other 16 municipalities and the county except for uh, darn DeBerry <laughs> every year they bring in so much revenue from that power plant well good and no police good for their residents um, yeah, that's 3.40 is their is their rate proposed, and that's up, you know, really adjusted for inflation from 2.77 last year, or what would be considered the rollback rate. So, I think our staff really does do a phenomenal job trying to keep uh, the taxpayers' dollars in mind in every decision that they do make, and I just want to point that out. Uh, every once in a while you do have to have adjustments and there's continuing pressures associated with all of the things that a city is is expected to provide so um, I'll leave it I'll leave the budget at that uh, congratulations to y'all for for getting that done and thank you to staff and all their hard work and making sure it came together this year uh, the firefighters, men and women who walked on 911 Remembrance Day, really incredible. Uh, 50, 50 pounds worth 60. of gear, 60 pounds worth of gear, up and down 100 and some steps, just mind-boggling. And uh, yeah, God bless them for that, and for what they do every day. Really, police and fire, uh, being ready to serve at a moment's notice. 20. 24 7 365 and uh, with that we are adjourned thank you all Four minutes.